Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, like to bring this meeting to order. Thank you for coming to the beautiful city of Watsonville on this cold, chilly, brisk morning. <laughs> we are excited to have you guys here, and um, it's always a pleasure to, to host. So uh, before we begin, I'd wanna, I just want to make a couple announcements. Um, first off, good morning, Carlos. Carlos is going to be our translator this morning. He'll be translating into Spanish. I don't know if he wants to say a few words or... Um, I know he's translating right now, so thank you so much, Carlos. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair, directors. Buenos días, Carlos Landaverri. Brief announcement in Spanish para las personas que necesiten traducción al español. Tenemos audífonos, aparatos de interpretación están de este lado, a su mano derecha. Okay. Gracias. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I know some people are probably like, oh, who's the lady in the front row? Well, um, today Julie Sherman is not going to be here today, but sh uh, is it Shana Van Hoften? Shana Van Hoften will be filling in for her today, so thank you, Shana, for being here. I, we are going to, um, where's Gina? Oh, is Gina here? Oh, you're, you're going to do it? On jury duty. Oh, okay. Well, Gina's on jury duty, so we are going to do a swearing in of one of our directors. <laughs> Dan um, Rothwell, will you please take um, your oath? Okay. Raise your right hand. Constitution of the state of California. All enemies, foreign and domestic. Constitution of the state of California. Freely. It's always so strange how we're sitting here and then have to get sworn in every like time, you know, it's the seat expires. It, well, I think it catches us all by surprise. Um, also, I wanted to announce that the meeting is today is being televised by community television and the technician today is Mr. Lynn Dutton. So thank you. And also from the city of Watsonville, Mr. Doug Mattis, thank you for being here and being our technician today as well. Okie doke, I, it's time to take roll call. Here. 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 Thank you very much. Okie doke. Well, we're going to get to the first item of business, which is um, electing our new chair and vice chair to the board of Metro. Um, I just wanted to say a few words beforehand, if I don't, if you guys don't mind. I just wanted to say I, I thank you for the privilege of serving as your board chair for the last year. I can't believe this year is up and it flew by. Um, I really appreciate everybody that participates with making Metro the form of transportation up and down the county for so many people in this community. I want to say thank you to the staff who works so hard to make Metro um, you know, what it is today and I want to say thank you also to my union um, fellow, fellow people who um, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with over the last year as well. It was definitely a team effort, and we did accomplish a lot. And just because I will be not the chair anymore, I will still be very actively involved with um, Metro as a director. And um, I will continue working on the important issues that Metro faces. And 
We do have a lot as I have been working over the past three years on uh, as a Metro director. We see what we are now facing with this new administration and the effects that um, it is having on us. So we um, need to continue to fight for transportation and for public transportation. This is an important part of our community. It is it it serves the it serves people from disadvantaged communities. It serves students. It serves people of all walks of life, people who are just want to, wanting to save the environment and not um, get a vehicle. So we definitely need to continue to work um, to preserve this great um, organization that we have here. And we need to continue working on you know, the, the things that make, at least in Watsonville, you know, we're working on our station. And over, the, over this past year, we've been able to accomplish a lot. And we were able to bring in um, a customer service rep. I think that was in this past year. and. Um, we are working on a mural that will be um, erected on the wall. We have been um, working hard to get the new buses. Watsonville is getting its is Watsonville is getting the first electric bus. So um, I'm excited about that. I was hoping it would have been during um, my year as chair. It didn't happen, but it will come. I'm told <laughs> the electric bus will come. So we are looking forward to um, starting, you know, you have to iron out all the kinks for when you're, when you're transferring over to a t new type of technology. I mean, remember when we used to look at the big TVs that were a bit the big tubes and then the, the, the thin ones came out and we were like, oh, some of them don't work. And then finally now it's mastered. Well, it's kind of the same thing for a bus. So we're waiting for that bus to be mastered. And um, I know Aaron is just probably like every time I'm like, when's that bus coming? So, but, so thank you very much to everybody. I am going to... Um, be passing the torch over really soon and I look forward to continuing to work hard for Metro and and of course if you ever need anything please come to me as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Jimmy. Okay, yes, Mike. Thank you. I, I want to as a member of the board I want to thank you for your services chair. You've done a magnificent job. Um, I know you've been incredibly engaged. I, I've having served as chair before maybe the public is not so aware of it that you spend as the chair a lot more time working more directly with the staff they, they need to have a sense of what the board is likely to do about issues and sort of plan for things and to know what kind of information we need and you've been playing that role i think in a really really positive way so i want to thank you for your service it's really helped the people of this county thank you thank you thank you mike the left. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I just wanted to second that and say I think you've done a really magnificent job. And I think that that electric bus for Watsonville should be the Jimmy Dutra bus. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> yes, Norm. You know, I have lived in Watsonville since 1966, and I watched a lot of transformations. And we are in a process constantly on the board and in the management of transforming some aspect, if not all, of our tremendously wide-ranged metro system. And yeah, you did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it as a citizen in Watsonville and a rider every day of the buses. Thanks, Norm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Whew, man. <laughs> I'm not used to taking that. Um, okay, so let's move on to, God, my eyes are watery. I can't even see through the paper. Um, and I'm getting older, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're too old. <laughs> probably a better explanation. I'm like, that's probably the real thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find the chair sheet. Where is it? <laughs> yeah, no, but I want to look at the sheet. Oh, the, oh, the sheet, yeah. There it is. Okay. Here we go. So um, we are going to elect the new chair, and the nomination sheet is as follows when I find it. Here we go. Got it. Okay, so the nomination for next year's slate will be Bruce McPherson will become the, well, when elected, Bruce McPherson will be the chair. Um, we only have one slate to vote on, just to let you guys know. Cynthia Chase, vice chair. Capital Projects Standing Committee, Ed Botorf, Cynthia Chase, Bruce McPherson. The Finance, Budget, and Audit Standing Committee, John Leopold, Donna Lind, Cynthia Matthews, <clears throat> and Oscar Rios. The Personnel Human Resource Standing Committee, Bruce McPherson, 
Cynthia Chase, Jimmy Dutra, Norm Hagen, John Leopold. Um, SCCIC representative, Cynthia Chase, Norm Hagen, John Leopold, Bruce McPherson, Oscar Rios. SCCRTC representatives, Ed Botworf, Cynthia Chase, Mike Rodkin. SCCR, this is the alternatives are different. Right, for the same body, the alternatives. Oh my gosh, I'm looking at the wrong, li I'm looking at the wrong line, sorry. Jimmy Dutra, Donna Lind, and Dan Rothwell. CEO goals and objectives, ad hoc committee. The chair will appoint, so Bruce, <clears throat> or the elected chair will appoint that. Legislative ad hoc committee. The committee uh, appro was approved at the January 26, 2018 board meeting. It's just, the chair will appoint. Mac, the MAC ad hoc committee. The committee was established March 24th, 2017. This committee, the chair will appoint. Whew, we have a lot of positions in this board. <laughs> so anyways, um, that is the first and only slate. Does anyone else have a slate they would like to offer at this time? Okay, with seeing none, then. Any, you should ask if anybody else has a nomination. Or a nomination for a slate. Seeing none, I will move that we adopt the slate as proposed um, and all those positions. Okay, we have a first and a second. <clears throat> Can we do all or does it have to be an individual vote? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Congratulations, Bruce. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Condolences. Stay right there. You're, you're all right. I'll just keep that. Mr. Chair, yes. I just want to make clear I'd be willing to serve on both the CEO um, Service Committee and on the MAC uh, Committee. So the, those are appointments you'll be making, but I'm willing to serve on those two, either or both of those two committees. Okay, and I, I would, uh, that would be great. I would uh, have to do it now. Yeah, I know. Like um, I would appreciate it if any board members uh, uh, would let me know what their wishes are, if they would like to serve on one of these uh, ad hoc committees. Uh, that'd be great. So we can move on. We won't make that uh, public until next month, for sure. Okay, very well. Okay, we will um, move on. Let's see, the additional, um, well, first, uh, let's see. We'll... Um, Move on to uh, Board of Director comments. Are there any comments from the Board of Directors? Okay, seeing none. Uh, communications, uh, do we have any written comments from MAC? The MAC? No, no. Okay, uh, Labor Organization Communications. Any labor? <coughs> Good morning, board. Michael Rios, PSA Chapter President, SEIU. Um, I just want to uh, thank Jimmy. Uh, you know, thank you. You've been a uh, big help for us, and your open door policy was was huge for us. And I just want to thank you and uh, look forward to still working with you in the future. Um, Bruce and Cynthia, congratulations, and uh, we hope that we can have the same open door policy with you that Jimmy had, or you guys can have with us that Jimmy did. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Well, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Juan Garcia, uh, VMU president. Um, thank you, Jimmy, for all the help you've given us. And as well, uh, congratulations to uh, Cynthia and Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Juan. OK, are there any other uh, Jim, comments from labor? <clears throat> in there too <laughs> and, <laughs> and say so, uh, Joan from chapter SCA Jimmy thank you as well um, we have uh, I feel like had a good working relationship with you and we've really appreciated that and um, congratulations to Bruce and Cynthia good. thank you any other comments from labor uh, any general comments from the board of directors I ask that uh, for but from the general public but the, but the general public as well any other general comments that items that are not on the agenda sure yes um, not on the agenda thank you <clears throat> Brian peoples with trail now I'm here to express our displeasure our concerns with board members from this board continuing to advocate for the train over buses with the recent Sentinel article by a board member um, that's truly unacceptable 
I want to remind this board that trail now supported measure D and we held off. We didn't support measure D until they moved millions from the train to the bus system. We did that. We supported it along with Greenway, supported that move. This board has not been advocating for buses at the RTC meeting and it's evident from the recent Sentinel editorial that advocated a train. So I'm hopeful that this board starts to work for what they're chartered to do, which is support buses, not trains. Train study's been going on for 30 years. It hasn't, it doesn't work, and the evidence is, is true. The corridor's been sitting for seven years as a vacant lot. We estimate that that corridor, when it's opened up, and used as a transportation resource. It's two to three million dollars a month in economic benefit to our community. Where people who don't have a car can ride their bike. Where it will allow the mom not to have to drive her kids to school. She can, her kids could ride to school. So we believe that when that corridor gets open, it will be a significant economic benefit. And I want to remind you that we believe it's going to be a transportation trail, not a recreational trail. And we're not trail only, we're trail now. So when we talk about how we use that corridor, it doesn't, we don't dictate that no mass transit vehicles. We're not on that page. We're supportive of ideas that support Metro. We know a train doesn't work. If you have a train, all the money's gonna get sucked away from your buses. And I'm hopeful that the union and your riders start to pay attention to what you guys are doing at the Regional Transportation Commission. Because you continue to advocate a train over buses. I go to all those meetings. I'm there. We're watching. And I'm telling the public, board members from this organization are sitting on their hands, been sitting on your hands for seven years. Actually, you're not sitting on your hands. You've been advocating the train over buses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Could you, did you want to speak? Uh, you could come up to the podium, please. Morning. Uh, my name is Ophelia Gomez, and I come back because I want to make the petition here again for the running buses early, Santa Cruz to Watson Beer, 71 and 91. I do in, 19, in 2006 the proposal, California Code Regulation, check it out, please, everybody, say it's $40, no more, no less, for the ride for Cabrillo, for the college in general. So I made the proposal, I remember it was, um, some people was here, I was in the committee hut, and we, we pay obligatory fees now in 2016 and 2017. What happened, they even don't include the senior people from the Stroh Center. So we wanted for the everybody, disabled, senior students, everybody using the buses. So it's two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars, almost three hundred thousand dollars from Cabrillo, for the forty dollars for each student. So we're asking from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. You can check in the difference between we have a lot of buses from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. What is Santa Cruz? Don't deserve on this forty dollar obligatory for each one people head like or not like I bought. And even though I was doing the proposal, I was the one in 2006, 2000, in 2007, and go all the meeting before maybe someone was here before. So it was ob no obligatory. So now it's obligatory. Now we have uh, this money running up over there, and they tell me that it's not having money, that they already got the money. Where is the money goes, please? We're asking Santa Cruz, people in the community, disabled or not disabled, families, students, children, we deserve one early bus. It's only seven uh, six forty five to seventy one. We want one early bus, and also the ninety one want a more early bus too. Adding more more choices. I come in late uh, because I was at seven twenty five. I came running on my enduring legs, frozen my hands to coming for your meeting today. I asking the goodwill 
the good spirit. It doesn't matter the political thing. It doesn't matter the, the budget. Right now, is what is the forty dollar in the budget? So I don't want to be uh, bring the California Code regulation. It's, it's the law. Let's go by the law of the land. Let's go by the law of the California Code regulation. Forty dollar for each student from Cabrillo. Where is the money goes? It's a huge job. It's our job. The community say, what happened? We asking. We have a ah, we have a petition here. Some people, because they are seniors, or some people, because they are working, they can't come in. But we need the bus. It's not because they don't want to come in, be here. Should be here, the whole community. So only me, Mrs. Gomez. Don't tell me I'm the angry lady, complain lady, because I always working voluntarily for many, many years for different projects. And my heart is with the community. My heart is with each one of you people. I don't want to vote. I don't want to give me the glory. Just only we want to. Early buses for everybody, for the community. I feel grateful. I want to ask him goodwill, good spirit, enlightenment, a spirit. Open your spirit, open your heart, open the budget for early 91, 71 Santa Cruz to Austin Bill. Open the pocket, open the budget, please. Thank Before you. the May 7th is the new sketch. Thank you. I appreciate it. Don't forget that because I don't want to be the, the voice in the desserts. Thank you very the much. Claims appreciate it. California co regulation. Thank you, ma'am. $40. Each people are Gabriel. Ma'am, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you so Anybody much. Anybody else would like we'll to address this for? Um, so you want any more? We bring more. Who's not on the agenda? Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos, and I just want to bring to your board's attention: you have the opportunity right now to act on this woman's public comment. I hear all the time at meetings like this, you can't take any action, can't comment because it's not on the agenda. That is not true. Under the Brown Act, and I have a copy of it here from the League of California Cities webpage, um, what happens when a, pub a member of the public raises a, s a subject not on the agenda? While the Brown Act does not allow discussion or action on items not on the agenda, it does allow members of the legislative body or its staff to briefly respond to comments or questions from members of the public, provide a reference to staff or other resources for factual information, or direct staff to place the issue on a future agenda. In addition, even without a comment from the public, a legislative body member or staff member may ask for information, request a report back, request a pla to place a matter on the agenda for a sub subsequent um, meeting, and that's what you need to do here. <laughs> Um, subject to the body's own rules and procedures, ask a question for clarification, make a brief announcement, or briefly report on his or her own activities. So I come to a lot of these meetings too, and I'm always dismayed when people like this woman and others and myself get up <coughs> and take the time to come to you and bring you our information and our questions, and it's like it goes off in thin air. You don't respond, uh, there's no action taken, there's nothing even discussed, it's like we weren't even here. And you have the opportunity, you have the legal ability under the Brown Act to acknowledge and to at least have a bit of discussion and to put things on the agenda right now. And I'm asking you to do that with what this woman has brought to you. So that's one thing I wanted to talk with you about here. I also uh, want to uh, bring up the uh, inbound 71 Aptos Village bus stop relocation, which has not yet been activated. I would like to ask when that stop is planned to be activated. It is very dangerous. Uh, now it is constructed, There's the lane striping's on, it is clear that the bus will not be able to exit the lane of traffic when stopped. The bus bay is too shallow. There is no railing along the sidewalk, the 100 foot long 5% grade sidewalk that will make it very difficult for people with mobility challenges to access this new bus stop. There is no uh, shelter that was promised when this idea was approved in concept by the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Commission in 2013. To my understanding, Mr. Montesino has never seen the specifications. 
And I'm asking you to put a hold on opening this bus stop until there are future improvements. And finally, Thank the you. Portola uh, Pleasure Point meetings last night were abysmal. There was no representation from Metro there to discuss Thank the, the Thank bus you. stop in the reconfiguration Thank of you. that traffic lane. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and what she said about the bus stop. Uh, we attended a meeting of uh, commission for uh, elderly and disabled where a gentleman was describing the new bus stop, a glowing description of how nice it was going to be, but kept referring over and over and over again as to the tight spot that it was going to be in. Yeah, it's a tight spot, all right. <clears throat> he said something about uh, on the, uh, up, you know, get off the bus and you head up there, uh, up toward the upper level, about how there are going to be all these nice get off and rest spots. There's none. There isn't one get off and rest spot for somebody in a wheelchair or in, on crutches. It's a steady incline. As a matter of fact, the incline increases as you head toward the top. It starts out as an incline and it increases as you move up. So I want to know why, and I said this at a meeting, at the meeting that we attended, why trade a perfectly level, centrally located bus stop for that one, the new one, in a tight spot? Described as accidents waiting to happen. Now, we've already had the first accident involving a car and a school bus. I tell you, I advise you, that people are going to die there. It's a very dangerous situation. And I want you to go out there and take a look at it. And let's get rid of that bus stop and put it, leave it where it is or move it in that area to a more desirable spot. But that bus stop that they have built there is dangerous and people are going to die there. Good morning. Um, I'm Dan Stevenson. I'm a driver for the Metro. I just want to make a couple of comments about the, uh, the proposed, or maybe it's passed as a pilot project, the code of conduct, the passenger code of conduct. Um, when I was at the meeting last, the last board meeting, it was the first I had heard of it. And so I, I'm maybe late in making these comments, but if you're going to revisit it in the future, maybe you can take this into consideration. I have some concerns about the code of conduct. I haven't seen what it actually says, but any code of conduct I have concern about with regard to passengers because one thing that we need to be aware of is that as drivers, if we're going to be enforcing a passenger code of conduct, we also need to be reconciling that with the fact that we're under obligation as our license and, and public servants to honor civil rights of individuals on the buses. And if this code of conduct is being stimulated by complaints from passengers about other passengers and their conduct, those people that are complaining don't necessarily have the same kind of obligations and responsibilities we do as drivers to honor everybody's individual rights. And so, you know, if we're going to be in a posture where we're going to be enforcing a code of conduct, we also could be in double jeopardy in terms of also violating a person's civil rights in terms of, of of how we handle that. So I just want you to be aware that's a very sensitive situation. Simply putting a code of conduct together uh, uh, that requires passengers to behave in a certain way because other passengers have complained could get us into a situation where some drivers feel like they have um, now the authority to act as police officers and, and, ex and exercise excessive authority that then could end up in a lawsuit w against the, uh, the Metro because of somebody's civil rights being violated. 
It's a very, very sensitive situation uh, when it comes to kicking somebody off the bus or handling somebody's behavior. We have an obligation to give people the right to access public transit, and we basically do that right now. We basically, um, you know, allow a lot of things that maybe make some other people in the public uncomfortable. And so we just have to be aware that the passengers that are on the bus are not necessarily uh, aware of our civil rights responsibilities. And so w when we respond to complaints of the public, we need to respond in a way that takes that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address us on items not on the agenda today? Hello, my name is Kate Hitt. I'm a PVUSD school bus driver. I happen to be the one that uh, was in that accident at uh, um, Trout Gulch. The woman tried to pass me on the right. The lanes are too narrow. Uh, we can't turn right or left onto Trout Gulch safely. People are not obeying the law. They're not waiting back behind the tracks. I don't believe the tracks should be used for a train. They should be used for pedestrians and, and cyclists. It's way too dangerous for a train there. Um, I drive to Aptos every day in my 40-foot bus. I go to Valencia School, Aptos Junior, Mar Vista. I'm stuck in that traffic every single morning. And do I see any buses? No. I don't see any 71s. I don't see anything out there because they're all stuck in traffic. The last two years have been pathetic. We need to do something. And what I'm suggesting is that you provide shuttle buses for neighborhoods. And you, instead of having single hubs, you have routes going through neighborhoods, picking up people. We transport almost 9,000 children. Imagine if every single one of those children had parents that had to drive them to school. We are offering a bigger service than Metro. So you need to step up to the plate and provide more door-to-door -door services for people so they can get to work locally, they can get to hubs easier, and get off the road because this is becoming a very serious situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. More 71 buses to Watsonville? Absolutely. More express buses from Watsonville and back? More for seniors? There are people that live in Aptos that cannot go home if they want to go grocery shopping because there's only one bus a day. That's absurd. Thank so you. this is my feeling. And uh, by the way, I'm the publisher of um, Becky Taylor's uh, Tell me the number before infinity. So, I'm very, uh, I'm very savvy about this county. I've lived here for almost 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to address us on items not on the agenda? Good morning, board members, and uh, welcome to the house that good government built. <laughs> I want to thank. Uh, Chairman Dutra, former Chairman Dutra, for his hard work on this uh, group. You know, it's not an easy task at all, and, he, and he's really done a, a fantastic and, and marvelous job. So thank you very much. I also want to thank Mr. Hagan for his long, long service and, and uh, continue to uh, be an activist in our community for uh, public transportation. I also want to thank uh, Mayor Rios uh, for his uh, long interest in this body, and uh, certainly Mr. Rotkin has a wonderful history, not only in Santa Cruz, but in Watsonville as well. I remember when he used to ride his motorcycle down here with his guitar on his back and serenade us at the Mellow Center, and so thank you. Thank you all, uh, directors, for your hard work and, and dedication to try and make public service uh, and, pu and public transportation available to our residents. So I want, I want to pledge our cooperation from the city of Watsonville to do whatever we can to uh, assist you in providing uh, safety in bus stops and, and the, uh, the, the remodel of the, the uh, 
the, the transit station and, and whatever we can do with uh, cooperation uh, across the river with our friends in Monterey County and, and Tamsey. And, and we thank uh, Eduardo Montesino for his uh, work and his willingness to uh, be uh, appointed again to our, as our representative to Tamsey. So congratulations on the fiscal turnaround. I know that money is always very, very tight and many needs that need to be taken care of. But uh, you, you've uh, manned the boat uh, fiscally, and congratulations on that. I will ask you about the traffic report from the north today, because I, I know that you saw what was going on in the other direction if you came down from the north. And I think that's really one of the big issues that need lots of cooperation. And, and it's true, the buses cannot move any faster than the cars or the cargo trucks or all the other stuff that uh, clogs and congests the roadway. And that means that the elderly and the disadvantaged and the low-income folks, they, they can't get to where they need to go either. And so congratulations with the electric bus, the bus stop safety, the new station, but let's all work together somehow to uh, improve the services that we can do, and I, and I also want to thank the employees because it's, it's really the uh, workforce that moves the, the people in this community. And so thank you all, and, and thank you for your public service. Thank you, Councilman Hurst. Appreciate it from Watsonville Street. From anybody else would like, yes. Uh, no, wait till we're no. done with the public. When you're done, I um, Anyone else from the public who would like to address us on items not on the agenda? Do you have a comment? Uh, I do. I, I have a couple of comments. I'll make them quick. First, thanks to Lowell Hurst. Always appreciate uh, hearing from Lowell and uh, his support for our work. Um, to, mis uh, to Mr. Stevenson, who's a bus driver, I just want to say you should read the Code of Conduct because we created it for the, just the reasons you're talking about. So I appreciate the concerns that were expressed there, that we don't want to capriciously throw people out of public the right to, to use public uh, transit, but uh, we have to go very carefully figure out how do you get rid of a troublesome passenger who is making the ride impossible for everybody else on the bus, and that's what I think we've done. So if you find problems in the actual code of conduct, not abstract problems about having a code of conduct, but how it actually has been written, please let me or other members of the board know. We're happy to look at those. I, I read it carefully, and I think we've done a pretty good job of balancing the right of each passenger to be on the bus as long as they don't make it impossible for other people to enjoy their ride at the same time. So um, I, again, I welcome comments about it and problems with it rather than the concept, but the actual way it's written. Um, I have to say um, uh, to Ms. Steinbrenner from uh, Aptos that um, the bus stop issue, I mean, she raises it. There are concerns about it. I assume our, I'd like our staff to get back to us about the concerns. I assume this stop does meet ADA requirements. We wouldn't be operating if it didn't. Um, I know a lot of this fight has to do with a fight against the um, project across the street and the issues that are going on there. That's what it came out of. And there may be, it's, that doesn't mean there aren't issues with the bus stop that need to be addressed. But um, I get concerned that we're, being um, raising questions about this bus stop when at least we had an earlier report on it. And one of the things that you had said that she had said was that, you know, we don't get back to people. But I know that the last two times you were here, people got back to you because I w was part of pr forming the answer to the questions you've been asking. So we go out of our way to respond when people get up in front of us. The other comment we had was about not spending more money on a particular route. Well, we, we have limited resources. That's the reality that we're facing here. And again, um, the, uh, it's not that what they're asking for would be a, not a good service or something we wouldn't want to provide, but it, I want to know what we're going to take out of our service to make that happen, because we're using every nickel we have on public transit. We don't spend it on anything else. Um, we're not a for-profit company. It's not like we could take it out of our profits. We, we use all the money to run public transit, and I think we've got the best mix of services we could have. The argument that we should have a different kind of a system that uses pulse, that, uh, buses run on routes in the neighborhoods or deliver people door to door. We've studied these things three or four times in recent, in the last decade, to say nothing over the last 30 years, and found that the system we're operating is the most efficient way we can run a system 
given the limited resources that we have. And anybody that looks at this place from outside realizes we have a tremendous public transit system for a community our size. You find me in another community in the United States that has 260,000 people that runs a bus system like we do, I'd like to know about it, because I don't think it exists. Um, finally, as a point of personal privilege to the first comments that were made about my editorial, I stand by the op-ed, the, the uh, uh, editorial that I wrote in the Sentinel, and if you read it carefully, you'll understand it's not an argument for rail. It's an argument for preserving a transportation corridor. And I think the best way to do that is to make sure the rail stays there. And I'll make the argument again. Anybody that thinks if you take care of that rail out and turn it all into a bicycle and pedestrian path, that somehow you'll ever get it back again for a busway or for a serious transportation corridor doesn't understand the politics of this county. Once that's made into a park, it'll be a park forever and never transportation, to say nothing of the money we have to give back because we bought that right of way with transportation money. So I stand by the comments that I made. They're not pro-train comments. They're comments about preserving a transportation corridor, which may have a train on it, might have a rapid bus rapid transit system, or some new technology that combines rail and on-the-road service. We don't, that exists in the world now. There are buses in Europe that run on rails and get off the rails when they get to certain intersections and so forth. So I don't know what that uh, corridor is going to be. But the idea that we're going to preserve it for transportation by making it into a bikeway, and I say this as someone that doesn't own a car, I ride my bicycle all over the place, that we're going to have a bike system that people are going to ride somehow from Watsonville to Santa Cruz is absurd, and I'm going to say that as clearly as I can. So I stand by my comments in that op-ed. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Drukter. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make a quick comment on the code of conduct um, um, piece that the gentleman spoke about. I, you know, I'm completely supportive of this, supportive of this, because people don't have the right to infringe on other people's civil rights. There are homophobes, there are racists, there are people who sexually harass people every single day. So without a code of conduct, you put those people at jeopardy, and there's that will never, that is something I can never stand with. So I, I stand that we need to protect all people, and if you don't have rules and guidelines, then you put a lot of people at risk um, of, you know, being harassed. So. Um, I, I want to say that that's where I stand at the Code of Conduct. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Um, yes. I happen to be one of the individuals who you can see rides around in my wheelchair. And uh, yes, I have gotten off at that stop. And yes, it is fine. I do not have any problem with it. I've done that two or three times. I've ridden the bicycle and walkways from the library in Aptos all the way down to uh, beyond that stop. And I have no problems with them. And I hear my comments, or the comments constantly about handicap, we need this and we need that. Yes, we need a lot of things, but this is not one of the changes that is adversarial to me and my wheelchair. Quite the contrary. It is safe, it is functional, it has a uh, signal that I can get across the street again without getting hit. And I, I refrain from saying anything because I don't want to add more fuel to the fire. However, when you refer to, quote, the handicap, you might try writing in the wheelchair to find out what it really is like. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll get back. There's no more comments from the board? Or? Okay, we'll move on to um, the additional documentation and support of it. Uh, there are some um, pages um, 12, 9A, 1, and 3, pages 19.1, and then an item 25 that we'll get to on the Highway 17 New Trips flyer. Um, we will now move to the consent agenda. Uh, we have items number 12.1 uh, to 12.10. Is there anyone from the, um, the board that would like to pull a, an item from the consent agenda? I have a quick comment on okay. consent. Just on item 1206, which is the report on paratransit service. I want to note that the, um, no, the uh, paratransit rides that arrived within the window that's uh, uh, expected 
Uh, our goal is to have 95% of those within that window. We're not at that goal. We're quite far from that goal. However, if you look at it carefully, you realize we're far from the goal because we're off by three minutes or five minutes. We're down, we have very few buses that are 20 minutes late or a half hour late or something. Nonetheless, I really think people have a right to expect that they're going to get the service when they we're told it's going to deliver, and it's very frustrating. My son, who's disabled, has sometimes waiting for paratransit service, and when it doesn't come on time, it means they're going to be late for some appointment or something, and it's very, very frustrating when that happens. So um, I, I just want to say we need to keep up the effort in really moving back to that 95 percent of effectiveness, or we need a bigger discussion of whether 95 percent is not reasonable anymore. Maybe the shared ride program has made that. That was our goal for a very long time. Now that we have more shared rides, maybe it doesn't work, and we need a bigger discussion about what, because we should be able to tell the public, this is what you can expect. We can't deliver perfect service. We know that. But we shouldn't be telling people it's going to be 95% of the time it's going to be there when it's not there 95% of the time. So I want to congratulate people for the improvement in the service, but we have a ways to go still on that one. Other than that, unless there's others, I'll be happy to move the consent agenda. Hey, I do want to find out from the public if they have anybody from the public would like to uh, comment or withdraw an item from the consent agenda. Okay. We have a motion to move approve. I'll second. The second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so consent and prev uh, agenda approved unanimously. We have a presentation of an employee longevity award for Pete Legaretta. Is he here? Peter here? No. Okay, well, we want to thank him for his 30 years of service. So it's uh, quite an accomplishment. Thank you very much. We really appreciate those who are sticking with the transit district. Um, okay, we will move uh, now to item number 14, accept and file the year of to date of monthly financial report as of November 30th, 2017. Angela Aiken, finance manager, will comment on that. Morning. Good news. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Got money. Uh, we need some. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go. Okay, so the financials that we're showing to you today are the ones that we have closed through November. Is that, is that mic on? Um, as you can see here, just as a snapshot, our operating revenue is about $58,000 above budget. That's a good thing. And our operating expenses are about $140,000 under budget, which is also a good thing. The majority pieces of that, and that was just for the month of, of uh, November. Year to date, we're $327,000 ahead in revenue. We're about uh, or $916,000 above under in expenses. So we're saving ourselves on the expense side. That totaled us to about a million two so far this year. Here's a graphic that shows you the actual versus the budgets. The first one is your passenger fares. We are behind on our passenger fares. Our ridership is not what we were expecting it to be, so we're down by about $200,000 on passenger fares. But our sales tax is coming in pretty strong. Um, we have uh, higher receipts of about almost $500,000. Uh, I just got the report for this past uh, month, and we are actually at about a 5% increase. And we budgeted, uh, I think, or two and a half is what we budgeted for this year. Other revenues, uh, we have uh, more ad expense or more ad revenues that are coming in, and uh, because we um, have more money in our coffers right now, the interest is more than what we we're expecting. Um, we have some other operating assistance, eleven thousand dollars that came in above what we thought we were going to be budgeting. On the expense side, um, you can see here if I push the button, uh, labor. and for the regular labor, the overtime and the fringe benefits, take those all three together. And the variances, as I can show you up there, we've had some vacant positions, which we always have. Uh, we've had extended unpaid leaves, which is something that is reoccurring. But the two big things that hits this is um, we have much lower medical insurance premiums than we thought we were going to have. Um, we haven't gotten into all the details as to why yet, but the medical providers have charged us much less than what their estimate was a year ago when we were putting our budget together. And so we've had significant savings on our fringe benefit side. Along with that, we've also had um, significant workers' comp savings. Um, this past year when I was in the HR department and with our new HR manager, we have uh, been working our worker comp cases, and we've been able to settle a lot of them uh, much lower than we thought we were going to be able to. 
That's under services on this chart? Is the fringe benefits. You put... Um, I'm looking at the chart in front of us. Where, where is the savings you just talked about in medical, for example? Would be under the $808,000 okay. savings. Fringe benefits. Thank you. Fringe, fringe benefits. benefits. Yep. On the service side, we have some um, projects that we have not started yet this year. That's why we have been have some savings under the service area for professional and technical fees. MoMA materials and supplies, those ebb and flow depending on when we buy um, the equipment, mainly in the facility and fleet area. And on the other expenses, that's mainly our um, settlement account. We uh, straight line the budget of $150,000 that we have in there for the year. So far, we have not spent what we expected to spend on a monthly basis, but you never know when something's going to be coming through on that. On the capital budget side, uh, year to date, we've spent uh, $659,000 out of our $19 million capital budget. These are the different uh, revenues that we would be spending. The next page shows you the uh, items that we've bought. So on the miscellaneous side, that's basic, basically we've gotten into contracts with the AEDs that we bought. Um, we On the construction side, that's related to security projects and the operations building closeout. The IT projects for 3,000. Revenue vehicle replacements, we have the electric bus, some charges in there for that. Uh, bus engines that we're redoing, we spent about $100,000 on that. And bus repaints, we spent about $20,000 on bus repaints. On the non-revenue vehicle side, uh, we have a budget in there for that. We have the majority of those non-revenue vehicles in, but we still have a few more coming in. Questions on the budget so far? On the, on the ridership, um, the economy is coming back. Is, is that a normal trend? I mean, we had an estimate. Um, when the economy goes up, people get back into their cars um, generally. And is that is that a, an indicator, so to speak, uh, of an economic recovery, shall we say? I'm actually going to be presenting you an item in a couple of minutes okay. when I speak to that, so maybe Very good. I'll wait. Thanks. All right. Oops. Wrong way. So the additional information that I usually provide for you is the unemployment rate. Um, as you can see, it still went up a little bit, but it's still pretty low, 5%. Our gas, though, is still climbing. You're at 3.23 uh, back in November. Our monthly ridership, as you can see here, the uh, total is about 250000 and our local service is around uh, 190 some. Highway 17 is around 26000 and Cabrillo is around 31. So this is where we think we stand today. This is our preliminary for January. Um, our operating expenses, we're still um, um, behind on our labor. We are over on our overtime and our fringe benefits are behind for the same reasons that I had said before. Our non-personnel expenses were behind by $700,000. It's not that we're not spending it, we just have not incurred all the expenses at this time. So our top, total operating expenses right now, we're about a million five behind. So we're saving that much money. That's good. So now I'll go on to the risk piece, so keep that number in mind, the million five. If SB1 does not prevail through the um, political waters that it's in right now, we would lose a million two. So I'm very happy that we have about a million five into the good right now, but it is at risk, that million two uh, for this current year, and next year it would be a million seven. That's how much it's worth to us in our operating budget. On the capital side, it's worth an additional 600000 to almost 700000 each year. So it's about a $2 million, $2, $2.5 million um, revenue to us if that uh, SB1 is repealed. And the, the, that, that'll, the, that'll be a measure that's, uh, there's signatures being, trying to be gathered to um, have a referendum. Uh, the legislature passed Senate Bill 1 last year. Uh, get the new gas tax, the measures on the ballot, or the, the uh, 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 efforts being made now to collect signatures to uh, wipe that out in the November election that would take a majority vote to do that. In essence, SB1 says uh, that you could not increase, increase taxes for transportation without a vote of the people statewide in, this, in a statewide gas tax. 
Um, that'll kill not only this transit district, or not kill it, but it'll hurt it very hurt much, us. but everything else that we have in local roads in it as yep. well. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Clifford. Yep. Yes, thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Um, and we'll have an item uh, a little bit later on agenda in which we'll be asking the board to pass a resolution on those two matters. Um, Angela's going to put this slide back up when we come back to that discussion so that we can really make the point about the importance of SB1 not being overturned. The other point I want to make is when you look at our budget and, our, and how well we're managing the budget and the underruns, a lot of those underruns related to some vacancies, think of an underrun, a favorable variance in any given month or year as one-time money. You can't program that every year. It, you know, if you have a favorable variance because you have vacancies, once you fill the vacancies, that money is expended. The money that Angela shows you in attachment A, that's real recurring money. We lose that. We have to rip that out of our budget through the entire five-year program, uh, and it's devastating. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Good. <laughs> That's just comments a, from the public. Any other comments? Are there any comments from the public? About Move the, that we accept the report. Second. Move and second that we accept the report. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to item number 15. Uh, to consider the issuing of a formal uh, invitation for bids for roof and window replacement at the Pacific Avenue station. Any uh, discussion or presentation? Yes, go ahead. Good morning, directors. Aaron Alvey, purchasing manager. Uh, this item is for issuance of uh, two IFBs, one for roof replacement, one for windows replacement at Pacific Station. Uh, we are asking for uh, not to exceed value of 350000 uh, of PTMISEA, which is the Public Modernization, Modernization Improvement Service and Enhancement Account Program, which is a state program um, that you're familiar with, and, and we're, uh, we're talking about the fiscal year 15 allocation, and we've been talking about this for a few years now. So. Um, as you know, we are in talks with the city of a possible um, partnership for uh, a new or reconfigured transit center. Um, we, we're, we're still going down that path. However, today the roof leaks, uh, windows leak every time it rains. Um, this is a 20-year-old roof on there that's been patched <coughs> several times, and we feel that we're still going to be using this transit center um, for at least three to five years, no matter what we do. And we want to make sure we have a safe and um, um, healthy environment for staff and the public to, to conduct business at this location. Um, I, I did want to add, um, if, if you want to walk through the PTMISEA allocations in the back, that's sort of um, the discussion that we've been having. We've had it in the Capital Standing Committee meeting as well. Um, back in 2015, uh, we had, I'm sorry, 2014, we had uh, put an amount of uh, almost $6 million on Pacific Station as sort of a, a, a holding place um, for, for various projects uh, under consideration at Pacific Station. Um, over the last few years, we have reallocated that money to the Metro Base project for the Judy K. Souza operations facility. Um, and then we've also used it for grant matches, which are very important. Um, so it, I, I can I can walk you down. Uh, basically, of this, the six million, um, we have about 1.9 at this time um, parked on Pacific Station, and we're asking for 350 for these repairs. Um, again, that's not to exceed 350, and I did want to add um, that we can also look into repairing, again, patching the roof um, more. Uh, and um, um, re replacing the windows in a, in a more simple um, version, more of a repair than a complete repla replacement. Um, and that would obviously cost less than the 350. So we're looking into that. Um, so, so that's what we're asking for today. We would really like to um, make these repairs and get the transit center in a good state of, of repair. 
Thank you. Um, any comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Rothwell. Do, uh, what kind of a roof is on there now? Is that a composite roof? It's a membrane, so it's um, uh, it's it's sort of a plastic membrane. Uh, it's. Um, when do we start repairing it? How many years ago? Because you said that it's been there for 20 years, right? 20 year old roof, so it was brand new 20 first, years ago. First repair was the year after it was built. <laughs> <laughs> there was a repair a year after the, it was built? Uh, I mean, that seems really odd to me. It's, it's the kind of roof that you, you can cut out sections and replace. Kind of roof you'd never want to do it again, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets complicated after you've, you've repatched it. And if, if you're familiar with the layout of Pacific Station, it has many different sections. And, and um, it's not just one overall roof. Um, Eddie, our maintenance manager, can probably elaborate. Good morning, board chair. Our roof is a, it's a PVC membrane roof. We can uh, prolong the roof. Uh, one of the one of the issues we may have in doing that is once uh, once we get into the roof, I don't know how much damage is under the layer of the PVC membrane. Basically, that's that should be all plyboard, but if that's all rotted out and then the structure under that is rotted out, then of course that's going to get into some uh, uh, additional expenses. So. Would that be more than, excuse, uh, than the, the 350000 that you're, you're asking for? Included. Yeah. That's okay. included in that price. Okay. We're not going to be using the same material, though, for this new roof? We're going to try something different? It would be the same material. It would be the same, same material. material that was repaired after yeah. the first year? It's a common material that's used. <laughs> it, it would be the same material. Uh, uh, of course, new. <laughs> but it would be uh, a, a same type of material. It was an installation problem in the first year. No, it was, wait, it, was wait, wait. it was not the, the nature of the roof. It, there was an installation problem, which we had a fight about at the time. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Any other comments from the board? I have a question. Yes, um, Director Chase. So I was also looking at item 30, where there is something that references repair Pacific Station roof from fiscal year 13. Um, there's fun it looks like there's funding allocated for that there. How is that related to this? Sorry, item 30? 30? So item, uh, sorry, item 12, I apologize. 12. Yeah. yeah, 30, that would be a different agenda. <laughs> Thank goodness we don't have 30 items today. 13. 12, I 12? apologize. 12. 12 point what? 12 what? Uh, let me see. Hold on, I have to scroll around. 05B. It's the Caltrans 5339. Scrolling back and forth between two items. 1205B. Yes, exactly. Which page? Hold <laughs> uh, It's uh, you're looking at the consent item 12.05. Uh, yep. Okay. Director Chase, what which page are you on on that one? I'm scrolling, so okay. <laughs> back and forth between two items. Argument for hard copy. <laughs> yes, I know. It is an argument for hard copy, but that's not as good for the environment. So I'm scrolling. <laughs> yeah, maybe Carol? that would be easier. It's 12.5. Uh, B5. B5. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. B5. Yes, thank you. Okay. So that item, okay, so that is a, uh, a $15,000 item. That is a patch that we had intended okay. on doing, a small patch. Okay. And um, once we got up there and looked at the roof, and, and just walking through the buildings, you can see all the stains on the ceiling tiles from the leaks throughout. So um, we, we actually are hoping to repurpose that money into another one of these line items and, and do an entire roof replacement instead. Okay, so that wouldn't be included then in this repair? No. No. Why not? Well, l like I said, instead of a patch, we determined that the entire roof should be replaced instead of just this $15,000 patch that would have only taken care of one small section. 
I, I think the question might be, Correct. can we use $15,000 less PTMI SEA and use this money? We'll, we'll definitely look into that. That's a good that, observation. Yeah. It, if it's allocated for that, it seems like that could combined. be combined. Yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. Right. Gotcha. Double check um, that the way the grant was written allows us that kind of latitude. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions from the board? Um, comments from the public? You, you please come Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Again, just to make a one comment. So I hear a lot of things about the grant opportunity, the 1205, more grants. I hear $300,000 to build the building, the roof, and the, and the metro bus. But I don't want to hear and again any things about the 71 bus and 91 that, one bus. Let's stick with the the. I no, know I hear we, about the bus. Yeah, I know we we know. No, but I make just the, the the little comment again from the Robert Law. He say any comment for the public. So my 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 concern is, see the roads is falling down, the buses. We hear the, the other comment of the lady. We need more buses for the community. Okay. If we asking one more bus 71 and 91. So okay. the money is over there. We have the money here. California code regulation. So don't forget, keeping in the budget, keeping in the agenda, keeping in your, in your mind each one of the, the you people. One more bus. Okay, thank you. Yes, less than $300,000. That's your yeah, preference. Yeah, we have to pay. I got it. Cabrillo okay. pay. We are in pay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just not me, community, people. I got it. Thank okay. you. Okay. More comments from the public. Uh, good morning, Chair, Board of Directors, Claire Fleisler, City of Santa Cruz, uh, Transportation Planner. Uh, as you know, we've been working diligently between Metro and the city since at least 2001 on a partnership project to reimagine and rebuild Pacific Station. Um, when we first started, the source of funding, PTMISEA, had $5.8 million in it, and it's been uh, steadily spent on other needs, including uh, new rolling stock used for grant matches, and we understand those needs. At this point, we have some concerns that a portion of this money is being now uh, put forward to be spent for things that seem more like routine maintenance and repair, so roof repair and window repair. Our hope was going to be that this would be a source of funding used for a, a much larger project in partnership that we could move forward on. So just as a point of concern there, and we are committed to moving forward on a partnership project here and look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the public? I'll bring back to the board. Uh, Director Botorf. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to ask for the board's indulgence on this one. Uh, as a member of the Capital uh, Committee, um, we haven't had a chance to meet and discuss this item, and I know we've created these standing committees with the intention of coming back to you and providing some guidance. And uh, we did receive a, a PTMISA uh, presentation understanding how these funds are going to be allocated. But I feel remiss because we, the com Standing Committee has not had a chance to meet and bring you back a recommendation about the expenditures, whether we go ahead and, f and fund these repairs or whether we you know, d completely do the whole new roof, new windows, mm -hmm. repairs. And I just feel like uh, at this point I would like to make a motion to table this till the next meeting until the Standing Committee can meet and come back to you and actually do our job and, and make some kind of a presentation to you. I'll second okay. that. A second, Mike. Uh, Director Rockin. Would there be a problem waiting a month? It seems to me like it would, I mean, it's been going on for a while now. It seems like a month would be all right. Fine, I'll, I'll support the motion. Next week, though. Yeah, watch it pour next week, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Pouring okay. for That's 20 years. years. But if it pours next week, this money wouldn't have been spent fixing the roof. Correct. Anyway. It would probably be open to be repaired. It would probably be a summer know. repair anyway. Yeah, so. exactly. Okay, we, we have a motion a second to uh, postpone this. Uh, we'll have the uh, Capital Committee Improvement Committee uh, look at this and come back to the board presumably next month. <laughs> uh, motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to item number 16 uh, to prove a consideration of an award of contract to Proterra uh, for purchase and delivery of zero emission electric bus and related equipment not to exceed $1,066,508. To be exact. The Jimmy Dutra electric bus. <laughs> there you go. There you go, the JD. <laughs> so we've been talking about this bus a lot. This is for the Watsonville downtown circulator. It will be the first electric bus uh, placed in service. So we're very excited about that. Um, it has taken some time. Um, today we're asking for uh, permission to 
award the contract. And once we award the contract, we can issue a purchase order, place our order, um, look at the HVIP voucher and, and get a discount on this, this bus. Um, and uh, I, the way that this contract will be structured is this is for now for a single bus. We have funding for that through the LC Top program, um, which is for uh, as aims to curb climate change and emphasizes new and expanded services for disadvantaged communities. Uh, so we have funding for this first bus, um, but this contract will also have nine options. So there'll be a total of 10 buses we can purchase with this contract. And we'll come back as we receive additional funding and, um, and, and make sure we go through the process with the capital budget and, and um, approval. Um, I can answer any specific questions if you might may have a, of the staff report. Thank you. Um, I just want to just say uh, these buses are expensive, one million dollars. Uh, I think people need to be aware of that. Uh, we have a fleet that is in great need with 60 buses or so, but uh, this is our first electric one. And uh, thank you, Mr. Dutra. You can talk about it. Oh, I'm excited. I mean. <laughs> This is going to come in 2025. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so what have we worked out the kinks or the problems with the, the electric bus? I know that we were having with, you know, in the past, is this going to run efficiently or was that just the over the, the hill buses? So we're having more performance issues with the over the road coaches. Okay. That, that, that's what we've been discussing with. This bus um, should be able to run the current um, maximum route, which is almost 300 uh, miles per day um, without midday charging. Um, we'll charge it at night. It'll come run the circulator route downtown and should make it back to the depot. Um, so this this bus is um, a little bit different than the over-the-road coach. Will there be a, a charging station here at the Watsonville station for? Don't anticipate needing one here at this point, but we are looking at that um, while we're planning our infrastructure for electrifying the entire fleet by 2040. Okay, and then um, what, I hate asking this question, but I'm going to. <laughs> What's the timeline? Um, so if we get our order in shortly, um, the bus is going to take approximately a year to manufacture. Um, we've been in close talks with Proterra. They're, they're ready for our order. They've promised they're going to get us in the production line as quickly as possible. So I would say a about 18 months would be the goal. 18 months? Okay. I'm saving this recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, Director Chase? Yeah, I, I appreciate that we've actually been sort of joking about the timeline on this a little bit because we keep talking about it. And I actually think it's really helpful for the public to understand both the timeline and the cost for this because a lot of them are, have been demanding electric buses. Why don't we have more? And the more we talk about the realities of finding the right infrastructure, actually manufacturing the coaches, it's, it's a, a helpful public education for people. We're working really, really hard to try to get these electric buses every time we can. I appreciate that you're finding matching funds and, and finding all these uh, grants and, and opportunities to purchase them. And, and I think it's good. We should keep joking about how long it takes because that then lets people know that this is the reality of what we're dealing with to try to replace an aging fleet, which is clearly a priority of this board. But there's all these other influences well outside our uh, ability to control that are limiting our capacity to do that. So I really appreciate that we've got this happening 18 months. At least we have a, a, yeah. we have a goal there. Um, one question related to this, though, is that actually the PTMISEA, which I got right saying, and I almost never get the letters right. Um, so with the portion of that, that that would go to this bus, we're reducing the budget from 1.9 to roughly 1. Million, right? or 1.5 million. So on the previous item, yeah. this 357.216 is included in the 1 million to 244 that's the other grant matches. Okay. It's already in there. Okay, so the 1.9 stays then. Several years ago. Awesome, thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Clifford. Mr. Chair, directors, uh, just want to double back to remind uh, the public that's no doubt watching on TV, um, this is our inaugural electric bus. We don't have any. And uh, we've tried to be very careful um, putting our foot, our toe in the water on our first venture here and not make mistakes. We're trying to spend, we have been for two years now, spending a lot of time learning from other properties that are ahead of us how this works. 
the last thing we wanted to do was place an order for a bus, even if we could have earlier, place an order for an electric bus, have this big, beautiful electric bus arrive on property and have it sit there for months on end while we, while we prepare the electrical infrastructure needed to recharge it. So we're, you know, that's been a struggle. We, we're analyzing the yard and how to design that infrastructure, and that has challenges too, because we don't want to design the electrical infrastructure for this one bus. As a matter of fact, because of CARB, and I'll talk about that later in my CEO comments, um, we're going to have to be 100% electric by 2040. So we need to lay out that yard and design the infrastructure and how the power arrives to our facility and the size of transformers and how you distribute that throughout the yard such that it's expandable so that we don't have a bunch of throwaway work. So once we get through that very difficult process, uh, our, our hope is that the two will be in sync, the bus arrives, we can do a great exciting ribbon cutting and put it on the street the next day. That's our goal. Thank you. Any other comments from I have a question here? for Alex actually. Do, uh, well, you just said that we're, you're going to, I know you're going to talk about this later at 2040, but so should we be investing into CNGs like we are, or should we really now be focusing on, okay, we have 20 years to come into compliance. Should we start really focusing on getting electrical instead of maybe, you know, we were like thinking, oh, let's get as many CNGs to, you know, replace the buses that are catching on fire. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And I'll use my uh, phrase that I coined before. We're, we're chasing the money. So if the money is flexible money, we'll tend to buy CNG buses today. If the money is dedicated money like a federal low-no grant that can only be used for zero emission buses, we'll go wholeheartedly after that money. At the end of the day, the reason why we have to chase the money is we have to maximize the number of buses we can buy given our deficit of 62 buses that we need. So still today, if we can buy two, if the money's flexible and we can buy two CNGs, I would recommend that to you before I would recommend one electric bus, just because of how much we have to catch up. Now, the other point that you're making is, is this mandate that's coming. Um, and so what will happen, now that's still being sorted out, but what will happen is progressively, between now and 2028, we'll have to buy more and more electrics with each procurement. So that's how we get there. And then under the current proposal at 2028, and thereafter, we no longer buy anything but a zero emission bus. And if you match that up over, over time in a spreadsheet out to 2040, we can get there. If the money's available, we can get there under the plan that you adopted actually last year, which has us phasing out of CNGs by about 2028, 2029, and being 100% electric at 2040. In general, what's the difference in the cost between CNG and, and electric <laughs> a bus? Well, can you it, just it, to, for the public it can to be know. kind of, well, kind of. It's in the range of about $300,000, yeah. 200 to $300,000. If we get the HVIP money, and we can't take that to the bank till we place an order, and then we have to hope the state has enough of that left over to give us the 150,000. So if, 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 if we get that, that offsets that 200 to 300,000 by about 150,000, it's still a more expensive bus. And then add in the incremental cost of the infrastructure to recharge it. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Director Rothwell. Uh, I'm just wondering if we can somehow you talked about you know communicating to the public, but I see a connection between the effort that's coming up to try to basically get rid of the SB1 money and what that's going to do to our budget, and then the fact that I don't think pretty much anybody in the county knows that an electric bus causes, costs a million dollars. I didn't know before I got on this board how much buses cost, <laughs> and when I heard how much they cost, I just about fell out of my chair. So I'm just wondering if we can somehow communicate that, maybe through the, the Sentinel, uh, Poweronian, um, to the public, how much this is costing. And that if we lose that money from SB1, it just make, means it's going to be that much more difficult for us to meet those goals. And to do what I think most people in this county would prefer, which is that we have low or no carbon emission transportation. And we can't do that if we start uh, taking money away from the budget um, by repealing SB1. So that's a suggestion. You're here. The other qu uh, questions from the board? Okay. Well, yeah, one. Oh, yes. Go ahead. On, on this, the topic of buses, I, it's come up in, in a couple of meetings. I've attended the uh, question of the number of buses for the Highway 17 route. And I've heard conflicting 
uh, numbers as far as how many buses we have right now operating on Highway 17. Can someone? 19. 19. Thank you. Does that include the... Uh, and how... It, it, 19 is, is inclusive of the spares. Okay. And, and but how... Okay, and then the other question would be how many um, trips over 17? How many um, options on that? <laughs> trips per day? Yeah, per day. That's been discussed in a couple... It's over 30 in each direction. The total 65. I can't remember. It's 32, 33, and then on weekends it's less. I'll get you that number. That that that's good information for me to have. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Look, public. Uh, any comments from the public on the issue? Comments again, say, I wonder if we no can have a morning for 71 bus early riding. Can, today, okay. 2018, can we have a more buses? My concern, let me, let me finish. My concern is buses for the hospital. We don't have a, yes, only one bus to go to the hospital, a few buses, little buses. So thinking when you be older, some of people here, like me, 60, 65, we need a Off. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We want to stick with the, the, the this this issue on the agenda. I I understand. I I understand. We, this is we want to stick with the item on the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Ma'am, uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Passive for the hospital for. Okay, thank you. No, ma'am, please stick with the item on the agenda. Uh, ma'am, ma'am, please. Thank you. Let me know. Okay, we. Uh, well, I'd like to make the motion on this. I'm excited that it's, you know, <laughs> this is coming to Watsonville, the first electric bus. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to make the motion on this one. I'll um, second it, it. Thank you. And Norm, okay. Norm, my second by South Mr. Hagen. County person, okay. Motion second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes, yeah, opposed? Passes unanimously. Can't wait for 18 months to get here. <laughs> 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 this will be, I don't, can't even. <laughs> oh, okay, it's a long haul. Too. Okay, we, we're going to item number six. We're lining up right now. Yeah, right. Just one we're minute. going to item number What's that? Just one oh, slight sorry. comment. I have lived in this county since 1966, and for Watsonville to lead in the electric bus program, to me, is a lifelong situation that I want to say thank you all. Thank you, Director Hagan. We're we'll slow. Go, we we'll go to um, <laughs> item number 17, approval to add a second customer service coordinator position to accept provisions to the current job description. Jolene Church. Good morning, board. Our, Jolene uh, Church, Human Resources, Human Resources Manager. Manager. <laughs> yes, I'm here today to um, ask for the approval of a second uh, customer service coordinator, and we have revised the job description. Similar to um, bringing descriptions um, in the past to you, uh, we've looked at our description to make sure that we can um, appropriately attract candidates. And so we made, we actually just made a very small revision and took out um, the transit-specific supervisory skills. Um, as you know, a customer service um, assistant manager would basically be what, what this would be um, equ equitable to, um, would need some sort of customer service uh, experience, not necessarily transit. Um, the history behind this is that um, when Paracruise and the customer service call center split apart a few years ago, um, there was some thought into the management and supervision, yet with the expansion of customer service um, call center hours over for fixed route uh, throughout the weekend, we now have a seven-day 
a weak situation where we need management and supervision of those call center staff, and we don't have that. So we have currently have one customer service coordinator uh, serving as that management supervision, and so we're asking for a second so that we can um, adequately cover the management and supervision of our call center uh, staff. Any Thank questions? You. Very much needed. Uh, Comments from the board, Director Dutra. Thank you. I, I just have a couple questions, maybe sure. concerns as well with this. Okay. Um, one is, you know, I, I think that the um, direction that you know Metro would like to take, or what I what I you know kind of feels that we'd like to hire with from within our company. Mm -hmm. I think adding this, um, sup, you know, that you have to have a supervisor's, you know, a customer service general, and to have also a supervisor, um, I guess, experience will um, kind of. Move, get, a lot of people will not be able to qualify that currently work for Metro for this position because they either don't have the supervisor title or, well, because they don't have the supervisor title. So, um, and to me, that's kind of, you know, I, I, li I like being part of organizations where we, you know, take hire within, mm -hmm. and this will definitely eliminate a lot of our current employees' um, opportunity for reaching this position because they um, don't have that supervisor title. And then my second concern is that, you know, if you hire someone just with customer service um, experience and not having transit experience, I think that you're going to be doing a lot of training. And sometimes, you know, when people have been in this position for a long time, I mean, it just becomes... It's like when I when when I became a realtor, I was like, oh my gosh, am I ever going to get this? Like, I this is so much to do, and then it just becomes you become a professional because of years of actually just practicing it. And um, so I think that when you bring someone in, like you know, who's a customer service for I don't know some other organization, they're not going to have the knowledge of how a transit works. So those are my kind of concerns, and I maybe you can comment on on my um, what, what I just said, or yeah, maybe I'm right. Yeah, or wrong actually. I have uh, considerable experience in customer service call center um, arena and um, having worked myself with about 85 call center staff um, and recruiting for those positions. What I found is people coming from um, all walks of customer service call center uh, have a basic skill and competency set to supervise and manage a call center specifically um, that actually does have a front end component, which would be our booth. Um, you have cash handling that, that that person who not only is working in the customer service rep position needs to have some sort of competency in, but in the, um, in the call center arena, there is that skill set and competency. So supervising those staff involves bid schedules. Um, that's not unique to transit. Uh, that happens in call centers anywhere. Um, and so bringing in someone with, with supervisory experience that has had that type of environmental um, experience where they've worked with both the forward-facing, the customer-facing booth, as well as the call center aspect, um, that's really the skill set that we're, we're looking for. However, to address your concern about uh, internal equity and, and promotional opportunities, um, Metro currently has in place um, a wonderful structure that uh, in the past has not been exercised, and that is a customer service rep up the career ladder would be a senior customer service rep where you would gain the customer service um, supervisory skills to then promote into a customer service coordinator. Um, good news is in next year's budget, we have unfunded um, the senior customer service rep. Yeah. Authorized, I'm sorry. So authorized and it is unfunded. However, that that exists in our structure. So that's exciting. It's not like we have to create positions in our career ladder. Um, so currently we have in place in our SEIU contract a method where we can work people out of class. So I can actually offer when someone is out on vacation who is a supervisor to be able to cross train and help build that skill set. So they don't have to have that supervisor title per se to qualify to um, for the to meet the minimum qualifications, as long as they've they've can exhibit that they have supervisory experience of one year, then they can qualify to um, to meet the minimum qualifications expected for the job of customer service coordinator. So prior, the uh, job description said uh, three years of customer service experience and or one year 
transit supervisory experience. And so now we're proposing that it's three years of customer service experience and uh, which includes one year of supervisory experience. We're not saying specific supervisor title, um, and you can get that in, in many, many ways. But if we were to say or, um, then our, what we already have in our structure, that senior CSR um, would- That qualifies, it, you're telling me that a senior CSR qualifies as a supervisor. The, experience. That's where you would gain the experience up the career ladder. As you as you grow in your job, you typically go from say that entry level to the journey or senior level, and then on up into the coordinator rank. Um, what we have done is within this particular case is um, made an agreement with uh, SEIU that in this case we would waive um, for our internal staff. Um, that have met the minimum years of experience as a customer service representative, they would automatically qualify to take the test for the customer service coordinator. But in all fairness to those applying from the outside as well, um, we wouldn't guarantee them an interview unless, of course, they pass that test. So we've kind of addressed all the equity okay. um, for our internal staff as well as for um, those who would be applying from the outside. So everybody who's currently hired has the opportunity to test for the senior um, position, coordinator position. For the coordinator position. Just a coordinator position. How do you get it become a senior coordinator so you can get the experience of a supervisor in order to become this position? We have built into, also into our SEIU agreement, um, the promotion, um, uh, a, a promotional uh, way of doing that promotion by qualification. So once they have met the minimum qualifications for the next up position, um, then they can they can bring that um, proof of qualification up, and then that is built in. That's that's something that we've already have built into the SEIU contract for promotional opportunities. It just hasn't been exercised in the past. And that position hasn't ever been up, so it's coming up. So that's gonna be now a new position that you guys are gonna be funding, I'm assuming? Yeah. Well, l let me just uh, try to clarify. So even though this uh, senior customer service uh, rep ha position has existed, um, it hasn't been authorized for some reason. It's just sat out there, it's never been authorized. And so uh, I need board authority I have to have it authorized, which we're going to put in the budget next year, uh, in order to have that position available. So the way that customer service representatives in the future will be able to gather the supervisory experience is in filling out of class that senior customer service representative position. How do they fill it out of class? Well, the customer service coordinator, the person who's doing this sort of pseudo supervision, that person uh, we'll take vacations, we'll be out sick, whatever, from time to time, and that will allow us then to reach down and have uh, CSRs, customer service representatives, fill the senior position and then, and then be able to act as that coordinator. Um, so the, what'll happen is they'll, it'll patch a hole in our current structure, allowing them to cobble together some of that supervision experience over the years so that the next time a position comes up, they'll be in a position to be able to compete because they'll have the skill set. So you're saying like two weeks is worth the whole years of of um, training, like if they're gone for a week of vacation and a week oh. of being sick. Well, you'll have two two people who will each be gone using their vacation any saying. number of times throughout the year. Uh, plus, unfortunately, people get sick, and that'll happen. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Questions from the public? Hi, good afternoon, or good morning, sorry. My name's Olivia Martinez, SAU staff representative, and you know Joan. We're actually in support of this moving forward because we actually work really closely with Angela and Jolene to make sure that our current members um, that want to apply for this position can apply. So we worked a lot of details with them and went back and forth, so we're in support of this moving forward. Um, so thank you very much. I second that. Um, you know, I know that there have been concerns with some of our members 
and we've spoken to them at length and spoken to management at length and we hope that we've come to we feel that we've come to a good solution at this point so i i am in support of this thank you do you, you uh, identify yourself and you represent represent you didn't represent edit. the sea chapter very good thank you uh, any other questions um comments from the uh, um audience okay uh bring it back to the board uh director Bottorf. Jolene, that's a great presentation. Thank you, and especially has the corroboration of everybody. So I make a motion we uh, approve the second customer service coordinator position and accept revisions of the current job description. Second. Second. Moved by Bottorf, uh, seconded by Rodkin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Go to, and don't go anywhere, Ms. Church. Uh, item number 18, approval of reclassification of lead custodian to a working title of custodial coordinator. Yes, this is an exciting one for me to be able to bring forward because this um, started long before I came. Uh, reclassification request for our lead custodian came in um, well over a year ago, uh, actually in 2016. Uh, took some time to go through um, the incumbent was out for for a short spell when i came in um, i waited for him to come back when he did i was able to do a desk audit um, which actually brought um, all of the work that had been done prior to, um, to where we are today bless you and um, it it was um, actually in doing the desk audit and understanding the day-to-day -day operations of, of how this lead custodian was uh, performing his job um, that led me to this conclusion um, that he has indeed been working out of class. We don't have a structure uh, currently that that would we would be able to support moving him into um, another supervisory position. Fortunately, because of the fact that we have this uh, customer service coordinator, we have within our own org structure designed um, this supervision in. And so what we've done is um, while we're, since we're getting ready to do that SEI portion of the class compensation, um, this is somewhat of a, of a, of a temporary fix to permanently fix this and that is we verified the reclassification request that this needs to be done providing retroactive pay as per the SEIU contract and then um, we'll permanently revise the job description um, for this incumbent to ac accurately um, reflect the duties that he's doing and address our structure as a part of the classification compensation coming up. So this um, recommended action is just uh, to approve the reclassification of this um, as per our agreement with SCIU um, and give him a working title of a custodial coordinator, which is the anticipated title that we'll have as a result of the SCIU class comp study. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Comments from the public? Sorry, the guys sat there. <laughs> Olivia again from SEIU. I, I really need to thank Jolene and Metro for doing this. Um, our member is really grateful about this, and this is true collaboration. So we, we strongly support this. Thank you. It's, it's been a long road that we've been on with this reclass request. And we're very thankful that we've finally come to this really good resolution. Right. And um, yeah, we just are very appreciative of it. Thank you, Jolene. Any other comments from the public? Bring it back to the board. Approval. Yeah. Move approval by Mr. Rotkin, second, second by and Dutra. Comment, comment and a comment well. from Mr. Dutra. Quick comment. I just want to say I, that was, I, I when I first heard the story, I, I was really moved by it. And I'm, I, it just really shows where Metro ha has their values and to be able to, you know, take care of this gentleman for all of the service. I, yeah. I, I, I personally th thank you guys and everybody working together to make this happen. Yeah. yeah. Motion you. a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimously. Item number 19, accept and file a Metro system ridership report for the second quarter of fiscal year 18. Mr. Yeah. Barrow Emerson. Good morning, new chair board members, staff, and public. And my primary goal for this morning is for it to still be morning when I finish the next six items. 
Second. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Second <laughs> approved unanimously. We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So very quickly, I'll try to move through them concisely, but they all deserve a little discussion, and that's why they're on your regular agenda, and, and particularly this item, the ridership report. As you know, this ridership report is traditionally on the consent calendar. I know you all get to read it, but I thought this was an opportune time to bring it out into the regular, and I've been telling you for a few months we would do so for two reasons. First of all, this is the first quarter more than a year following the service reduction. So it's the first time we're able to compare apples and apples. For the last year, I kept telling you, hey, we're down, but it's because of the... So now we can start to talk about apples and apples. Um, secondly, it's important to bring to your attention uh, the disturbing trend nationwide of public transit ridership. So I'm going to get to these things here. So first of all, on that topic, nationwide between 2015 and 16, public transit ridership, and that's both bus and rail, is down 2.3 percent. However, bus ridership in communities of less than 500,000 people is down almost 6 percent. So that's a real problem, and I'll go on to mention. So trains are doing better than buses. I think there's a general logic in that big cities, massive discretionary riders commuting to massed employment. So I won't go too far with that. But there are many factors contributing to the decline. Increased our car ownership is on an amazing climb nationwide since the recession, including lower income consumers who are the people most likely to ride buses. More folks on the lower income end have the ability to own cars now. With that background, I want to just provide you a quick profile of Metro's current ridership, the details of which I'll let you look through in attachments A1, A2, and C. All right, quarter two system ridership increased 7% compared to last year. We should be jumping up and down and going through the roof. We're bunking the trends. But there's some facts behind that that kind of uh, temper that. The fact was UCSC's ridership was up almost 17% over this quarter last year. But they also had 13% more school days. So again, apples and apples are always a little tricky. But UCSC and Cabrillo's ridership is helping us stem the national tide of shrinking ridership. Highway 17 decreased 3.2 percent, just about the national average for bus ridership loss. Growing congestion on Highway 17 along with a strong economy, a strong economy and relatively low fuel prices. Our inability to meet the demand during the peak hour full buses is pushing discretionary riders who do have the option to drive a car back to their car. They don't want to stand over the hill. Now, to start in a very minor way to address this problem, we have reallocated during the day the 30-some one-way trips in each direction, and we've moved additional trips into the peak of the peak. So starting on March 8th, there will be a new service that starts in Scotts Valley. I will forget the exact time, 6-something, going to San Jose. The problem previously, the bus from Santa Cruz arrived at Scotts Valley full, and there were 20 people waiting to get on. So I think we've made a really good move there. In companion with that, there will be a new trip leaving San Jose in the morning with the ability to get people to jobs in Santa Cruz by 9 and get people at UCSC to the 920 class start time. The flyer on the back table about that, if people in the audience are interested. Thank you very much. Um, might even, yeah. So thank you. Thanks for that. Um, now, the rest of our fixed ridership, the non UCSC, down 2.9% for all the reasons mentioned earlier. But let me throw out a couple of California and local things that really make this a problem for us. In California, after the passage of AB60, which allows undocumented residents to acquire driver's licenses, the number of driver's licenses per capita in California increased 4.5 percent from 2014 to 2016, from right before the passing to a year after the passing. That driver's license per capita had been stable for many years. A whole bunch of people went out and got cars. So, um, locally, in the past five years, and this is a little bit coincidental, both Highway 1 and 17 have seen a 10% increase in average daily traffic levels. That's astounding in five years, given the 60 or 70,000 vehicles a day that are on those roads. So it obviously increases congestion. 
Um, and again, we're caught in that congestion. Everybody knows that. We have no transit priority facilities in this county to beat the traffic. Um, I did want to touch on the question raised earlier by Chair McPherson. Um, as you saw back in the finance report, employment is great. Unemployment is very, very low. Therefore, people have more discretionary income. And relative to all costs in a household income, the cost of an automobile versus the bus is not, a, is, a, is not as huge a step as it would have been in a good economy. Um, lastly, the gas prices are starting to climb again, but they haven't reached what some of us suggest there are thresholds that are symbolic to the public. I've got to stop buying gas at $4 a gallon. As it creeps up, it's like the frog in the boiling water. You just don't get it. All right. So although FY18 quarter two showed a total ridership game, as I told you, this is primarily due to the strength of UCSC and Cabrillo. UCSC is, compens is compensating for that amount. As a matter of fact, over the last five years, UCSC ridership is moving at sort of a 2.5% growth every year. Hence the issues Larry and I have in trying to meet the demand from UCSC. And another important thing to remember about the UCSC service, without it, we wouldn't have very much or very good bus service in central and western city of Santa Cruz. That service level is way beyond what would ever be earned by a place of that size. It's lucky coincidence. It's right between downtown and a 20,000 person university. So reinforcing the nationwide trend of declining public ridership, locally attachment C, sh attachment C shows you the last 10 years of ridership in this county. And we're down 12% over the last 10 years although we did cut the service by 6% during that period of time, but it's still on a downward trajectory. Again, the university mitigating the big impact of that. So staff hopes that with the introduction of service improvements, including the additional peak hour 17 trips, the growing demand from our college partners, the introduction of the Watsonville Circulator in 2019, and many other initiatives that we're working on. As we've told you, we told you a couple of months ago what we have at each three-month horizon going out for the next couple of years. Whatever we can squeeze out, we will hope will address this problem. And maybe this can allow us to sustain and possibly grow our ridership. So that's my presentation on the ridership. I appreciate the opportunity to make it a regular item this month. Can I ask hey, question? one question, uh, Director Rothwell? Uh, what's the ridership with Cabrillo College? Is it up or down? Um, it varies from month to month because they have their days, but it's in the 30,000 range for any month that they have 20 school days. You'll notice in the financial item, there's a bar graph, and you see it drops significantly in the summer when they offer less and shorter classes. But we had 270,000 in the first year, and that was only a 10-month year. And we're looking at over 3 to 305 to 307 this year. So it's, it's over 30 for a regular month. My question was, was actually related to that. It looks like it was higher most, more recently than it has been in the past for Cabrillo. Is that, that just because of the school days? Um, anecdotal. Well, anecdotal. Um, as you know, we unfortunately had to have a second election in two years. And you know it was an overwhelming success, and less to do with our effort than the fact that the students took it on. I've told you before, I went to the clubs at the colleges, and all of a sudden those clubs were out beating the bushes. The turnout was radical, the success. So the students have gone to bat for each other. Now the awareness is up. As I work with my Larry uh, counterpart at Cabrillo, they're going crazy handing out student ID cards that they never used to hand out. Before the bus pass came along, they had less than 35% of students ever bothered to pick it up because you don't need it at a junior college. I don't know the new statistics. I'm waiting for them to finish. But the, it's, it's increased their workload extensively. So it's just the awareness, popularity, and the pricing is unbeatable. Great. That's encouraging. It's a start. Okay. Any other questions? Would we accept the report? Okay. Is there any, are there any comments from the public? Um, on that report. Or are we? Question is, is we don't have a, as Ophelia Gomez again, we have some ridership information besides Cabrillo at the university. 
because the people use the buses also for the communities. Just know families, etc. Workers, people that work. So we have a strong information about the ridership besides Cabrillo. I also have a more. I like a more, more information in the future about Cabrillo about the ridership. So they have a strong information, but we want a more. I just say waiting for more reports about how they're using the the buses Cabrillo. But also separate but a little bit of people that no is from Cabrillo that use the buses. So we have a song rather shit because this is part the the necessary use for the community to be planning and get more ridership, more buses if we need it. If I can respond to that quickly, just the, we don't have the ability to know where everybody gets on or off the bus. We are hoping to get that in the next year. It's going to cost about a million dollars for the system that we that would allow us to do that. We have accurate numbers for UCSC and Cabrillo because they have their pain for each ride that and so we know that information but for the other the community riders you're talking about I agree with you completely we should know more about that but we can't get that information until we have a system that allows us to you know account where people are getting on and off the bus all we know now is how many people you know rode on the bus somewhere but we don't necessarily know who got off on this stop and who's the difference between a Cabrillo rider and a community rider we we have no easy way to, we can tell you how many people are not Cabrillo riders, but where they're going or how they use the bus. The only way we can do that is with a fairly expensive survey where we actually put people out on the bus with clipboards, and we don't do that very often because it's very expensive, and you, and, and you can only do it on a, it, it's like you do it for a day and hope that's like other days, but you don't really know that. So getting this new system is going to be very important for us to get the kind of information you're asking for. It's a very reasonable thing to ask for. No, no, okay, I mean, is we know how much people pay for the ride, $2, $3. So that's what we don't... For the money that they got it from every day, they know how much money they got it for day. I mean, approximately how many people they use in the buses. But we don't know... We don't know the that. meant to address at some point probably they will have to address it at some point I think we're nearing a, a crisis in terms of the dependency on the automobile and the impact of it at the same time and um, what you know I've gone to the RTC meetings on the corridor studies and things like that I would really hope that this body do what they can do which is to really strongly advocate for uh, HOV lanes any way that we can have uh, buses um, raise their profile in relationship to the utility they have relative to an automobile. It's going to be helpful. I don't think in the end that mass transit is ever going to reach the level of utility that an automobile has, but when you factor in the impact that automobiles have, it, anything that we do do could, you know, make it competitive. So um, maybe uh, this body might consider forming a task force on some of these big big picture issues to form resolutions that we we submit to the state and federal government to to um, you know prioritize some of these things you know even even uh, changing the way buses are designed so that you have one side open for shopping bags and things like that so that people can carry more things onto a bus anyway because that's one of the things that automobiles have right now and are totally uh, advantageous over buses is you can just carry a lot more stuff in your automobile and store it there. You know, it's just we need to start thinking along these lines because I think this trend is not an accident. I think, you know, like I said, even, even poor people are going to prefer, if they can, uh, to, um, to, to have an automobile. And, and we need to try to figure out a way to change that long term. Thank you.
You done with your yeah, report? Are you, so I will move we accept the report. Oh, so, okay. uh, item number 19, uh, been moved and seconded that we accept the report. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Accepted unanimously. We go to item number 20, the consideration of award of contract to Dan Boyle and Associates for a downtown Santa Cruz transit operations analysis not to exceed $49,890. I'm very happy to be standing here today to get this project started. This project has been a long time in coming and is the result of collaboration between Metro and the San City of Santa Cruz staff. As the board members are quite aware, this consultant engagement is part of an effort to determine the best long-term plan for metro, metro operations in downtown Santa Cruz. The goals of this analysis include the following. To confirm the level of metro service which is needed in downtown Santa Cruz. Number two, are there other ways to distribute the bus bays in downtown other than in a hub as Pacific Station provides today? And can that be done in a more service-oriented or more cost-effective manner? Number three, are metro's current assumptions for today's and future bus requirements relatively accurate? This question includes consideration of whether automatic vehicle locating technology and other features that support it could help reduce bus bay requirements while sustaining and enhancing customer legibility and convenience. I can't emphasize more any more customer legibility, particularly with our custom race. But anyway, as a companion piece to this project is a conceptual layout exercise to establish the bus bay and metro ancillary services capacity on a plot of land that includes the current Pacific Station and the immediately adjacent city-owned properties, which include the Nyack Building and their small parking lot, which faces Pacific Avenue. An RFP for this project was released last month, and proposals will be due next Friday. These two projects will generally move in parallel. The one you're hopefully approving today will take a little longer, so it's getting a bit of a jump start. It's always be planned that they generally finish in about the same time late summer or early fall. In terms of the contract put forward to you today, Dan Boyle and Associates were deemed by an, by an evaluation team comprised of city and metro staff to be the most qualified from among the three candidate firms to provide the services requested in the scope of service. The value, as the chair said, the value of this contract is 49890 with the cost being shared equally between Metro and the City of Santa Cruz. That completes my presentation. Any comments from the board? Uh, I Director comment. Chase? Yeah, I'm just really excited about this. I think it's been a great uh, collaboration to get these things going forward. Um, the city of Santa Cruz is a, a really enthusiastic partner with Metro on this, not just for looking at the downtown Pacific Station, but really the whole transit system and seeing how we can make improvements that will increase ridership and increase the customer-facing experience. So it's just great to see these happening. I think we're going to get a lot of really interesting information to help us as a board uh, determine how we want to move forward as a district. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Director Rockin. Ditto. <laughs> Got it. When does that uh, happen? <laughs> but uh, we like it. Director Rothwell. This is a totally curiosity question, but how did they come up with such a specific number? It says $49,890. Oh, it was Why put out 50, as a, it was 50, simple. Was, did they have to keep it under fifty grand? Yes, that's the answer. And having been a consultant myself, you sneak up as close to the not to exceed okay. as you can. Okay. But since the product is offered and they were evaluated on hours of value they're giving you, you know, you get more hours of value for 49 than you would have gotten for 48. And remember that I developed the scope and cost <coughs> estimates of what it should cost to do this, and I've done that. I've done that job before. Thank you. Any other board comments? Uh, comments from the public? You have one? You have one? Carol. Oh, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Clive Fleisler, City of Santa Cruz again. I just want to reiterate what uh, Director Chase said, that we're really excited to start working on this project, and uh, we've been really grateful. It's been a great working relationship, working with Metro staff on going through the consultant interviews, getting the RFP, um, and selecting who we think is going to be a really good team for this project. So really looking forward to working collaboratively on this and coming up with a really great result. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other comments? Uh, Move the staff recommendation or second, second Jimmy's Move Moved by Rotkin, second by Chase. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. 
Now we go to item number 21 to accept initial fair restructuring analysis and concepts and direct staff to initiate public outreach. Thank you, board. And I will request your indulgence with a little deep dig here, but this is important. It's big and it's quite nuanced as an issue, but I've tried to boil it down to just sort of a, a straight line discussion for today. As the chair said, I'm just here to give you a status report and to ask you to direct us to initiate our first round of re outreach. A very similar presentation to this was provided to the Finance Committee on February 8th, which directed staff to bring this to you. A quick review of what we told the board in January. A fair restructure analysis is necessary because of potential risks to our five-year budget. Based on future budget projections shown in attachment A1 and A2, Metro will need additional revenue to maintain our current service level over the next five years. In addition, a fair restructure is a pretty typical process at a transit district every five years or so. Next, many of our five of our Bay Area peers have now moved their base costs for a single ride beyond our $2 fare. All right, first, I need to clarify a mistake I made in the narrative of the staff report. I apologize. I said in two places in the staff report that there would be no Paracruz fare increase as part of this project. I should have said that staff is not specifically proposing any increase to Paracruz fares and have not assumed any increased fares from Paracruz in all our financial models to this point. But I do have, in, in full transparency and clarity, I do have to remind the board that federal law requires that senior and disabled fares be no more than one half of the base fare for fixed route services. So if as part of this restructure you do choose to raise the base fare, you do have the ability or the opportunity at some time to bring Paracruz fares up to one half of whatever that is. We're not proposing it at the moment. Double it, not half. Double the Sorry. fare. Sorry, double. I apologize. I had senior fares uh, in my mind when I said that. So apologies. It can be up to double. So moving on from that, and I apologize for that mistake. I want to convey two concepts today. The first is the actual and relative amount of revenue that could be raised with a hypothetical 25 or a 50 cent raise in the base fare. And then secondly, I want to provide you a starting list of potential targeted strategies which we have developed to attempt to provide financial savings to some of our sub-segments of our ridership who will or would be most impacted by a fare increase. Number one, on the topic of how much money can a fare increase raise. Last year, FY17, Metro collected $9.4 million in fare revenue from our local and Highway 17 Express services. To put that in context, you know our budget's almost $50 million, so when you hear us talk about having a 23% fare box recovery, that's where that number fits. And that's important because, as I also mentioned at the last couple of meetings, we have a requirement to maintain that fare box ratio above 20% or risk punishment on some of the state funds that we receive. That's very important to remember. So I'm going to be referring a lot to attachment. Get this right. I think it is referred to as B here. Yes, it is. Attachment B I'll be referring to a lot for the rest of the uh, presentation. On the top line of that, you'll see under the, under the category gross revenue increase, analysis suggests that if you raised the base fare by 25% or, or 25 cents or 50 cents, Metro could see an increase in gross revenue, and I really want to highlight that word gross revenue, of almost $1 million and almost $2 million, respectively. It's pretty simple math to figure out how we get there. You raise the base fare and you raise all the passes at the same percentages and rates. That's say 12% and a 25% increase. It creates about that much more revenue. It's important, and it's critically important, to note that these revenue projections assume that UCSC and Cabrillo service contracts can increase by these same percentages. The ability of the two colleges to accommodate these increases has not been confirmed. And remember, they're essentially 50% of our ridership and our revenue, so it's very key to those assumptions that they can do so, and I can't speak for them today. 
Again, back to the topic of gross revenue. That number, that, ooh, that's really exciting, almost a million dollars, almost two million dollars. But that starts to dissipate when you consider some realities. As in any retail product sold anywhere, you raise the price, you lose some sales. Staff has analyzed previous metro fare increases as well as the experience of many of our peers around the country. Unfortunately, historically, most metro fare increases have come at the exact time as service reductions. We didn't do that here. We tried to survive this and split them and make them stand alone. Therefore, all the metro experiences in the last 20 years are a com combination of a cut and a fare increase. They're not very apple to apple specific, but they sort of reinforce what we've learned from the rest of the country because our losses have been slightly higher than cases where it's only been a fair increase. Nationwide peer in research, including the 2010 experience of VTA, indicates that recent increases of 10% in fares have resulted in a little bit over 3% loss in ridership. On attachment B in the column titled Net Revenue with Ridership Loss, is the assumption that Metro would lose 5 and 10 percent respectively with a 12.5 percent, 25 cents, or a 25 percent, 50 cent fare increase. So we're fully aware of trying to not fool ourselves or you with this great funding. We want to keep it an honest scale. All right, I'm on to the second part, and this is, this is a little thick, but follow with me on this. At the same time as we're proposing ways to increase revenue, staff has also identified some opportunities for the board to consider, which provide financial savings for various sub-segments of our ridership. Please follow along in attachment B, and I'll just touch on each of the five or six quickly to have you appreciate what we're trying to do with that particular one. Scenario one, I want to make sure I can reach to it any time during the conversation. Scenario one is the concept of increasing the base fare but decreasing the relative cost of a day pass by reducing the cost to two or two and a half times the single fare. Ours is currently three times the single fare. Transit districts range from two to three, depending on the percentage of people in their system who need to take multiple buses on a one-way directional trip. That gets kind of expensive. Now, of course, if you drop the relatively price, you're going to lose a little bit of money. So, for example, for the rest of the document, if you see the four lines in the rows associated with scenario one, depending on which proposed fare increase and which proposed reduction in the multiplier, you lose somewhere between $60,000 and $135,000 against that $885 and $1.7 million. Is that concept because that's really the whole concept, everything down the rest of the page. All right, thank you very much. The next three proposals, two, three, and four, are intended to reduce the number of patrons paying with cash through discounts for using passes or smart cards. Reduction in cash payments have the opportunity to help reduce metro operating costs as well. Dwell time, maintenance, delays in dwell times lead to the bus being late, it leads to overtime, it leads to unhappy customers, but internally it's got a, a significant financial impact. So, scenario two, why don't we increase the base fare but hold all the current fare, uh, price for the uh, pain with the pass? Well, you can see there the significant impact because they're very po currently a very popular way to pay for our passes. So that would be a fairly risky venture to give up a half million and a million dollars of this supposed effort to go out and gain money we need to deal with rising costs. But we wanted to lay it out there. It's kind of an example of the high end. And again, in those cases, we'd only be pe pe moving people to paper passes, which is only halfway where we want to go in the long term. And would there be additional costs for having to provide people with places to go buy more alternative things than they bring in a dollar with them in their wallet, or you know, $5 in their wallet? Yes, there would. We realize, and, and I was going to actually get to that with, you must have my notes here. Um, yes, the answer to yes, the more outlets for sales of passes would be better for it. But, Look at scenario three, which is the idea of holding the current fare for payments using smart card. We already know that our smart card is very difficult to get a hold of. It's not sold at many places. It's difficult without the technology we've been telling you we could have. You can't load your smart card at home yourself. Are you going to make a trip to the transit center to load your card? And when does it run out? So the technology is a huge opportunity here. So there's limited uses of these cards today. That's why it looks like the financial impact of it wouldn't be so big. Again, I referred to the technology opportunity. 
Scenario four is a real simple one. Why don't we sell people $11 in value for 10 bucks? That's not really a horrible impact given today's use of these cards. Now, of course, this is not an exact science forecasting impacts and behavior changes. We, the best we can do is use experiences of others and apply some common sense and professional logic to it. That was number four. Scenario five, this proposal is intended to create a fair product that staff feels will serve a specific demand. You'll notice in the financial column it says to be determined. We've been having a hard time landing on the exactly right product to meet whatever the exact niche here. We've played with time durations, number of rides. I'd like to hold much more conversation of that one. We want to spend some more time. I think we'll have a relatively definitive proposal in March. It's a tricky one because the lack of good solid research we have as to what we're missing in this arena. So let me move on. Again, adopting any of the above scenarios reduces that money we might make out of a fare increase, but those are judgments for the board. The premise of scenario six is about creating revenue to fund increased service. None of the other ones per se were proposing increased service. That's not to say some of the revenue couldn't be used that, but it's not a direct strategy of ours. However, in the case of Highway 17, there may be an opportunity. Again, your judgment. Right now, our 31-day pass is priced at a 50% discount. That's a great price. I know of no other commute bus services that offer a 50% discount. They're mostly in the 25 to 33% discount. Um, now, having started this conversation, I want to make it clear there is no suggestion of raising the $7 base one-way fare at the moment. We know we only did it two and a half years ago. That was a 40% increase. It is what it is. But if you consider that we could raise the multiplier of number of trips, when you buy the pass today, you're getting 40 or as many trips as you want, but think about making 40 trips in 20 workdays, we're selling it for the price of 20 trips. Maybe it should be more like 25, 26, 27, up to 30. And with that range of increased revenue, you could raise from 79,000 to 171,000 more dollars. Uh, with that kind of money, you could run two to six additional round trips over the hill in a day, offer more product, more convenience, attract discretionary riders, deal with peak loads, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an interesting concept. I don't know if it's what we want to do yet. And yes, do sir. Have, do we have the capital equipment to do that? In other words, if we say we pick that program, do we have enough over-the-hill buses to make it work? I will say yes in the sense that we have a peak pullout of approximately 13, and we own 19 buses. And as you know, we're attempting to get three new electrics. That's a very good question. I guess I can't exa answer it exactly at the moment, but there's the concept behind it. All righty. So all I've been talking about is getting more money from people, but what can we give the public for these increased costs? First of all, to be really direct, Additional funding is needed to keep the bus service we have today. I hate to say that, but that's a harsh reality. Um, there could also be an opportunity to provide a small increase of service in various locations. Also, Metro, as, as we all together have been speaking ad nauseum for the last couple of years, we want to get AVL because it's a product which provides great value to the customers as well as Metro. So there's an example of giving back. Um, fair payment technology, new area to get into, but that's another place where the primary goal is to increase customer convenience for how do I buy and how do I pay and don't make this any more hassle, otherwise I'll just go get in my car and go. And uh, Right, okay, sorry about that. So in the area of fair technology, there's two basic areas to think about at the moment. And they're sort of tiered. The first one is, is pretty common these days in a lot of environments. It's mobile ticketing. It's on your phone. You do it today on airplanes and you, sporting and music events. You buy it Movie with theaters. an app and you walk up and you either show someone it or you technology tap. That's a pretty interesting and I would assume we'll probably make some progress there. The more interesting one is things called account-based system where you all have an individual account. So life is not happening in the transaction right there. It's happening in the back room. You have an account backed up by your bank account and you buy your products at home on your computer or on your phone and in real time it deducts money and it validates your ticket. Very interesting, 
possibly a big uh, financial effort, but that's what we're going to find out. We're currently doing research to determine which of these technological improvements would be most effective at meeting our patrons' needs. The plan is for our, our team at the March board meeting when we make our fair recommendation to also ask you to allow us to release an RFP to vendors to get proposals for providing, providing these products. And the most important thing is, how much will they charge for it? And it's done in different ways. Some people have more money up front. Some people charge you a percentage of transactions. Um, and again, we got, and the other key thing is they take differing times to implement. Some can be implemented in months, some might take eight or 10 months because you have to do hardware on the vehicles. So we plan on coming back to you in August and saying, okay, here's what the vendor world is telling us. Given what we want to do with our fares, we suggest we pick that product, that product, and that product. And by the way, it'll take a few months to get it implemented. So we've always told you that no matter what we decide this May, we don't plan on implementing any fare changes until at least January of next year. The technology component might affect that suggested start date. Finish up here. So that's good enough on that. So let me just speak to the outreach process as we leave here today. And this is, in some sense, is the most important part. Uh, we've built the model of what we're going to do based on what we did a year and a half ago on the comprehensive operation analysis. As outlined at the January meeting, following the last month or so, you may have seen our staff in the field, you may have seen announcements through Gov Delivery that we have online research questions. It's all been about this fair technology and ridership patterns, which suggests which discounts might be the smartest and most effective to offer. So we walk out of here today, if with your approval, we start sending out Gov Delivery texts and emails to alert, alert current writers, directing them to the website for more information. We start putting information on buses and the transit centers, including what I'll do at Watsonville on the way back. We'll be providing newsletter materials to a number of community groups who are going to put them in their local newspapers and organization letters. That's all ready to go. I will be making a long series of presentations to various stakeholder groups, including those representing the senior and disabled communities. I spoke to the E&D TAC last week and we'll be back to them in another month. And we will have four geographically oriented public open houses during the next month or so spread around the county. Once a formal recommendation is presented by staff to the board on March 23rd, we will start a formal public comment process as we did last time, an informal first cycle and then a formal cycle. And as you'll remember, because of the oddity of our dates with our board meetings in 30 days, we will actually have, we will actually have close to a two-month formal public comment pe period between March 23rd and May 18th, when we will ask you to make a final decision here. This two-cycle process served us well during the COA and we hope that it will be equally successful at getting the word out, which is one of our primary responsibilities. Regardless of what we do, it's most important that we let everybody know what we're up, up to. Thank you. That completes my presentation on this topic. I have a question. Yes, yeah, so, Director Rotkin. Is this going to go before the Finance Committee, and if so, when? This, this has been going to the Finance Committee each month in lead of you, so we were there on February 8th, and we'll be back to them on a date as yet undetermined, or, early March and April. March meeting, though. Yes, we'll do it before each of the next three meetings. Thank you. Any comments from board members? Comments from the public? So, Mrs. Gomez here. So I hear that a lot of plans, a lot of things good plans, but my worry is, when they say one question, how many services they already pay, like we pay for Cabrillo, $40, see they're doing for Highway 17, how, uh, they already pay how many, $40, whenever it costs for Highway 17, they pay the service, but they will have the services then. So, when they talk about the planning to do more trips to, to the University of San Jose, it's a big good idea for the people that got working over there at the hill. 
So we don't want to have the bad expectation. We already pay the forty dollars a degree. We already pay my money from San Jose to go to work to go to San Jose University. We don't have the services uh, that should be have a, deserve to have. It. So I have a, well, I like poetry. I like. No, I don't want to be too, too philosophical or too political. But sometimes I have this word, I want to say this word, or this phrase. Sometimes we don't have it like we deserve. And sometimes we deserve have it something little more like we pay. So if so you want a hamburger, you want a good hamburger, or good sandwich, or good burritos, or good pizza. So we want to get these buses in the, in the way that goes, again, fair a price for the seniors and disabled. We get over there, everybody, seniors and disabled. And we want to see, see, we have a hospital, be taken care of that. So just not only the University of San Jose, University of Santa Cruz, we see that the university is good, but we see the services for the community. Like the Rider Shear in Sokel, all the middle school, high school, 71, is the only bus. It's for children, for teenagers, middle school, high school. Yes, 71, I come back and again from the 71, sorry about, is everywhere, everybody use it. So to make sense, see, we try to find it, what is the radio ship for up the hill, down the hill, Found the other she you I I try to think of, remember Santa Cruz please. I love Watsonville. I I come in here for my hospital, I come in here shopping, I come in here to the meetings, I come in here visiting. But we like Santa Cruz too. Don't forget Santa Cruz. I mean the other she mean for the community. I mean low income people, families, senior, children, people can go to the school to bring the children. We want to use the buses. So if you get the opportunity, you get the services to us, we pay. Oh, by the way, we don't want to pay too much to the people, the senior, because we don't have too much money. We get you older. So get in the boat, you get in the bus. Thank you so much. You. Don't forget Santa Cruz. Thank you so much. Hey, wait a minute, Meryl. I think that Becky wants to come up. Hi, Becky. Hi. I just want to point out the irony of of considering a plan that will c cut back ridership after the report says, saying that ridership is up. Okay, thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mario Torres, uh, Vice Chair of UTU. Um, I want to know where the money's going to go to for the revenue that if you guys were to increase the fares. Also, I don't see the point of having great technology if we don't have the bus service to go with it. Uh, people can know that they're going to run late without a cell phone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Uh, any other comments from the board? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Clifford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to clarify, so uh, if this uh, recommendation is adopted we will begin as we leave today the process of public outreach including press releases and try everything we can do uh, as Barrow mentioned we'll replicate what we thought was a successful process through the COA in order to get as much public interested as we can um, we're not scared of having large numbers of people come to a meeting that's a success if you have large numbers of people come to a meeting that's what we want uh, and as Barrow pointed out in the first bullet under the summary um, we, we are correcting that to indicate that we will also notice all of the paratransit folks about this process because at some point when we bring recommendations back to you you will have to decide whether you continue your current practice of taking advantage of federal law which allows you to go up to double base fare for your paratransit services or if you wish to keep that the way it is today and do other fare structuring changes but you're preserving your opportunity to look at that on either side of the equation down the road uh, therefore we will make sure we notice the paratransit customers unless you tell us otherwise okay mr rockton did you have a question i got a comment is this appropriate now or do you want questions sure. yes some? please um Nobody ever wants to raise fares on the people that you're serving, and obviously, particularly when you have so many people who are transit dependent. But the reality is, we're if we don't make these kinds of increases, we're going to have to cut service again. And so, maybe I'm belaboring the obvious, but I assume we're going to do like we did with the COA presentation: start off by telling people, "Look at our five-year budget. This is why we need to do this." It's not because we just, you know, 
want to keep up with inflation or some abstraction like that. It's because we'll be in a hole and have to cut service. And I think when you talk to the public, a lot of times if you say the choice is to raise the fare somewhat in the following way and here's how we're going to do it, and as a result, we won't have to cut our service, or we might even be able to expand something, but let's say for the sake of argument, not cut our service, versus, oh, the fares can stay just like they are, and you won't be able to get where you want to go when you want to get there. And that trade-off may make it worth to pay a little bit more for the ride, worth it on some level. And I think that's what the public has to understand, what why we're doing this, not because it just happens or something. It's because if we don't do this, we'll cut service. We will definitely do that, and thank you for pointing that out, because we, we don't want there to be a perception that somehow there's just this opportunity to raise fares and we're just doing it. We need to make sure the public understands what Barrow talked about in the beginning, and that is as you look out over the five-year projection of our budget, um, our costs of providing the service increase at a much higher rate than do the revenues to support the service. I think the other important point to uh, put out there right now, uh, given the audience and the availability of the the television media is to just let the public know uh, only 24 percent of the cost of operating the service is recovered through the fares placed in the box, only 24 percent. So therefore everything else has to be subsidies and uh, we, we have to ensure that we try to do the best we can do to keep that equation in balance and keep up with those escalating costs. Director Matarf. I just had a quick question, Beryl. You referenced a number about the uh, level of service. Remember over 50 percent of how much of our ridership is. I just wonder if you had a cumulative number for me of how much of our ridership is UCSC and, Cab and Cabrillo. I see. And Cabrillo, you can include Cabrillo. Okay, I would say Cabrillo. I don't want to get in and be wrong by five percent, but let's say that UCSC is in the 55 percent because it's been growing as a percentage. Obviously, Cabrillo. We talked last year about it being six to eight percent. Highway 17, I'd have to do quick math on my head that it's 350,000 boardings a year over 5 million. 15, 1 number. It, it's less than 10%. It's probably 6, six or 7. Just, well, I'll tell you what, you it's in the same ballpark as Cabrillo. Yeah. Cabrillo's looking like it'll end slightly. So it's more than Cabrillo by maybe 50,000 a year. You can almost assume that 70% of our ridership could be combined between CSC over the hill as a ballpark. Getting Actually, close. I, I love that yeah. you're nodding because I'm just looking for a ballpark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe 65. I just wanted to follow up on Director Rotkin's comment. Attachments A1 and A2, although they're quite convoluted, were our effort to show the picture of the reality of the cost versus the revenue. Thanks for that. Okay, any other comments? Um, see, we asked, we already had from the public? Or did, did, did you have a comment, Becky? Yeah. Okay, please come on up. Uh, I, I must say, I'd rather have a fair increase than a service cut. Okay, okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. We'll try to make... We, uh, to the point... Yes, right. We, uh, we appreciate your comments. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Stevenson, I think, has got a comment here, too. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, moving my car, so I missed part of it. But uh, uh, thank you, Barrow. And I, I just want to express appreciation for the process that's being engaged in here. It seems very comprehensive, very thorough, considering a lot of things. But I would put a plug in also for including um, you know, experienced drivers and, or people that have worked for the Metro for a long time in the process of data collection or getting data points uh, when making decisions like this. Let me just give you uh, three things that uh, come up for me as somebody who's worked as a bus driver for nearly 20 years for the district when it comes to fares. Um, fare increases, and I, I think he, he spoke to this point, but fare increases uh, can be offset by loss of ridership and also you know, um, a lot of times people don't really have the ability to pay the full fare right now. So, you know, the assumption is that everybody that is paying fare um, it, with a fare increase is, 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 you know, if you're collecting those statistics, assuming that that's going to be full fare paid, it's not going to be full fare paid. I mean, people just don't have the money to pay the fare right now a lot of times. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, just as far as the fare box and the efficiency of, of bus operation, relationship to fare. 
a couple things uh, that I've noticed. One is it's that you know when we compare ourselves to other transit districts or when we're trying to coordinate with other transit districts and riders that are crossing county lines, um, you know people are uh, riders are very often surprised that they can't get change. You know that they have to have exact change. I think that's something we need to be thinking about changing if we're thinking about changing technology. Um, it, you know all these things we want to do to reduce. Um, the cost for people who are not paying cash. Uh, I think we need to increase the efficiency for people that are paying cash because oftentimes we don't get full fare of those people just because they don't have the ability to get change. Um, and the other factor is um, tr uh, transfers. You know, we have absolutely no transfer system in our county except the transfer from uh, our system to MST. Uh, that's just something that people are disgusted by <laughs> a lot of times. And I think it, 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 it lowers our, our marketability. Um, so those are just my comments in 20 years of driving. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Do you have any closing Very comments? Very quickly, I, I didn't want to mention that today because the presentation was long enough, but we are working on a change card. MST has one. We're just working through the technology Great. of our vehicle. That's a good idea. Great yeah. idea. Thank, Thank thanks, you. Dan. Okay. Um, I think we just need to accept this report. Uh, I have a motion to accept, or I don't know if that needs a motion. Uh, Mr. Hagan. Second. Second. Bachdorf. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. We'll go to item number 22. Um, and I want to appreciate, say how much I appreciate being uh, elected chair in the, with the prospect of a fair increase the same year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank um, you for your service already. <laughs> <laughs> we won't uh, be naming any bus after you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll move uh, item number 22 to consider a resolution in support of Proposition 69 on the statewide June 18 ballot and in opposition to efforts uh, to repeal uh, Senate Bill 1, the gas tax increase that was approved by the legislature last year. These are two different um, issues and there's, uh, t there's a, a recommendation for a yes and then a no. So don't get confused. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Burrell. You'll clarify that very well, I know. I'll make very quick comments and let Alex maybe add some nuance. But I'm not going to repeat the whole title uh, the chair just said. But it is an interesting thing. There is an active Proposition 69 on the June ballot, which people with an interest in transportation want to support because it will stop the ability of the state to move transportation funds to general fund problems, as you'll all remember from a few years ago. I think it was Prop 48 or something. At the same time, this is a resolution sharing our stance and our opinion. At the same time, we're expressing our support for 69. We're expressing our opposition to the repeal of SB1. As we know, there's a petition effort underway to get a measure on the November 18 ballot to do just that. I, don't, I won't make a long speech. It would be catastrophic for all types of transportation providers, not just public transit. Um, the key for us, the funding, as Angela referred to earlier, and it's back up on the board, these funds are at the heart of our assumptions for the next five years going forward. So um, adopting this resolution will contribute to efforts to establish a strong constituency of transit and transportation providers who are in dire need of these critically needed funds. We're putting our hand up and saying we're with everybody else's in the same boat as us. And let me reinforce, Metro public funds would not ever be used to support or oppose these ballot measures. So that's the end of my comments. I'll defer to Alex. Perfect. No, I think it's been covered. Uh, we've also talked about the importance of SB1 today and in prior meetings, and I would encourage the board to support what we have before you. Um, support for Proposition 69 in June and opposition to the repeal of SB1 in November. Okay. Uh, comments from the uh, board? Right Comment, comments from the public? As a part of the Comité for Disabled, I feel worried that the only people disabled are coming and say, I agree to get pay more if they give me more service. I'm really cons concerned because sometimes we pay, for example, the $40 each one people can bring you, we don't have the whole service. So, and also the, the so, so they can get raise the price. We thinking a lot of people that go in the bus go to work, come babysitter, go to the the garden things. They don't have too much money, so if we raise more the price, 
I don't know about the ridership thing. Say about the discounts also, I hear about some discounts. So you get either the, the car phone discount. So probably the car phone discount will be working for the people, not having the $5, the $6, we have the car discount. But I really concerned about the getting rise the price so much that people can afford to pay. Right. So anyway, it's not as a comment, it's just a generic. So okay. it's the last one. So she, she raised more the price, like somebody say, as disabled, as a senior, I don't think so because we pay more than $3 or whenever it's the, the the fare right. for the for the disabled person or disabled or senior rights ridership. So if they raise my the price, I don't know if we want for everybody, for the senior also, because I'm representing the committee for the senior and disabled. This is my okay. my little paper right now, or my little pocket not working yet. This is not about the fares now, if I'm understand. In general, so, cuando se que okay, hear, I, I hear all the but, comments. In my concern yeah, that right was now. the last item, I think. That, yeah, my last comment yeah. is I'm really, okay. really worried that the people get really Thank low you. income or the people get senior can pay more more than $3, or the $32 the bus. That, that was the item previous, but go. thank no, you no, for No, no, but I, I thought the, the okay. comment in general. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments from uh, or motion by the board? I'll move the recommendation. Uh, moved by Director Chase, seconded by uh, Director Rotkin. Rotkin. And th this is the resolution that we're passing in support of these uh, measures. Yeah, to support, 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 uh, support Proposition 69 on the June ballot. And, well, uh, assuming that the repeal of uh, SB1 gets on the November ballot to be in opposition to that, and we can do that in one motion. Is that correct? Okay. Everybody understand that clearly? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? So ordered, unanimously. Okay, we will now move to um, the uh, number, item number 23, the um, articulated bus update. And those are those new buses going to and from UCSC. And uh, I don't know well, how it's I'll articulated buses, but the, the accordion buses going to. I'm racing in the morning. First of all, quick reminder, three buses leased from January through the end of spring quarter. They're out there operating seven days a week. All of 150 some operators have been trained to drive them. And the kudos and the thank you for UCSC who is paying the full boat for this. So some anecdotal comments on how it's going. It's all going good. The articulated busers are quite popular with students and are the subject of much social media discussion. Um, as a result of the introduction of these artics, Metro has not had to send extra morning trippers to campus to deal with pass-bys as it is a historical problem of ours, um, fairly common prior to their arrivals. Um, Student ballot measure, we've been telling you from the start, that's why we're doing this. The students have a huge decision to make, I think it's in early May, to whether to increase their fee. If they don't, not Larry's ability to buy services from Metro as well as fund services that he provides through his TAPS program will be threatened. So this is all part of, in a way, a promotion of this is what you could get and expect to have in the future. And we are still working about getting the cartoon slugs in the windows. So, Larry, did you have anything else you wanted to add today? I'll just briefly note that we've been working with the Student Fee Advisory Committee, the Student Union Assembly, uh, Devon, and uh, Alice Malmberg, who you've seen here before, to craft a fee measure that we hope will both fund and sustain the program and be accepted by the students. Uh, our current proposal looks to be a five-year fee increase that totals about $82 spread over five years. Uh, we believe that will be enough to sustain our program, including the extension or continuation of the articulated bus service uh, and the services we're providing on campus. So I'm going to be working in the next two weeks to take that to all of the student senates uh, for each of the colleges. Uh, working with a variety of student groups to help promote this. We'll begin campaigning, I believe, in April. I'm looking at Devon if he knows the schedule. Uh, primarily in April for May and the May election. We hope to know by early June or late May what the outcome will be. Thank you. And um, Director Chase. Yep. Oh. So I'm sorry, Larry, just, I'm, I think I missed it. I'm taking notes because I get a ton sure. of questions about yeah. this too. So if the uh, fee is passed by students, this would be able to maintain the three 
articulated buses we have now. I've built that cost in, assuming rather than just two quarters, the three okay. quarter academic year, yes. But not expand it beyond that at this point, as far as we can tell. We will see. Okay. Great. Right. I Thank mean, you. it may you we may find that it's more it's a more efficient way to provide certain bus services than the solutions that have been used to date. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thomas. Um, you know, just like being involved within student government and the students on our campus, um, they're not exactly big fans of um, paying more fees because we already we already pay a lot of money. Um, Thirty six thousand um, dollars is a lot of money for students to be paying per year. Um, they're not exactly the biggest fans of raising fees. I've talked to Larry and many students on our campus. However, the articulated buses have been um, not surprisingly popular. Oh, no, 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 no. no. It is popular. I'm not surprised by that. Um, like they're actually very helpful. Um, there's less students waiting at the buses, um, less students being late to classes. Articulated buses have been very popular on our campus, and so the timing is great since the measure comes in in the next what, two and a half months to vote on. Um, so I, I'm hopeful for it to pass. I want it to. Uh, the students, I think, would be very fond that we able to keep the articulated buses on our campuses because they've been such a big and tremendous help. Um, so I'm really excited about this process to go on for the next three months. And you said the buses are leased until when? Uh, well, the ones we have now will go away in June at the end of spring quarter. Okay. They will not be here for the summer. Okay, that's that was yeah. I was curious about that's, that. Okay. Yeah. They might be back in the fall. I hope the they'll be back in the fall. We all do. And okay. we continue to look at what our summer demand is. As summer school becomes a more important part of our entire year-round program, we have more people who come to campus, many of whom are continuing students who already expect the style and level of services they have during fall, winter, and spring and want to be able to get around without a car during their summer session programs as well. The last thing I'll note is, uh, yes, this is a fee referendum, a fee measure. Uh, Devon reminded me that this is the first increase to the fee since 2008, and so we've managed to go 10 years, we've managed to go into debt over 10 years <laughs> by continuing to provide the services without any addition to revenues but for enrollment additional students who are paying those fees. But of course, the costs are rising faster than that. So uh, the scale of the increase we're looking at now, in effect, makes up for a decade of no increases, plus what we try to do to the future. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a comment that this is a, a great example. I want to thank UCSC for putting up uh, the money to have us test this. and. Uh, it's, uh, they've been a tremendous partner throughout our uh, metro life, and uh, I can't say enough about the appreciation I have for UCSC and what it has done for this district. Um, we would not be surviving without UCSC. Yeah, I, I want to say that um, there's battles going on between the city and the uh, university all the time, but this is an area of exemplary uh, cooperation and, and success. Um, my students talk about these Arctics all the time, and, you know, it's not often in class that people get all excited about some local issue that's you know even if it affects yeah. them but this this is yeah. actually a topic i'll come into class people <laughs> be talking about the bus when they when i walk into the classroom and stuff it's kind of it's pretty exciting kind of a process going on um i was at wanted to ask larry you're going to go talk to these various um i'll call them structural political groups like the college uh, committees and so forth but have you got a plan to go talk to like environmental groups and the campus democrats and groups like that because uh, to me a big argument at UCSC about this ever since we started this relationship back in the 70s is that uh, students who are not all of whom necessarily even ride the bus but really believe that having public transit at this level is critical to protecting the environment. So I think you know a visit to the CalPER group on campus and groups like that is just as important as say Stevenson's college committee or something. Absolutely. We need to go through the uh, student government process because it's a ballot measure. So I'll be seeking I'm sponsorships. I'm not saying more of them for sure. But. And we'll be going to another variety of groups from uh, environmental, uh, some of the cultural groups, um, uh, democratic students are also engaged. Well, we don't, we don't have any seniors on, on campus. Um, we, we have a variety of other venues that we hope to pursue. We'll probably be doing pop-ups at bus stops. Um, I'd love to get any of my colleagues from the board to help on this well, as well. I'm happy to help. So, happy. You, know, you have my number. Call on I me. I do. <laughs> me too. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Mr. Chair? 
Yes, um, Mr. Clifford. Ever so briefly, I just want to double back to a comment that Barrow made about the slugs not being on the bus. Um, you know, from a marketing perspective, that big articulated bus markets itself in some respects, but that, that white paint scheme is just boring. Uh, and the scheme has always been that we would have these decals, these slug decals, and add an element of excitement and visibility to it. Um, and to that end, Larry, Larry's been a little bit challenged to come up with the money on that. He's tried, tried, tried. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going, not a part of your, the action before you, I'm just looking for a, a negative visceral reaction. If I don't get that, I'm going to proceed uh, under the authority that you've granted me to uh, make an offer to share the cost of those decals. I really would like to get them on the buses. Um, I've been holding back on the press pop just because I think it adds an element of excitement for that press pop. Right. Well deserved. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important thing to pursue. People love the slug buses. There's a there's one in particular that travels around um, the city, and I think that's just a great way to get more attention to the articulated buses and, and get people even more excited about them. I, I, I didn't want to be like mean or blunt, but yeah, they're really boring looking. <laughs> like, 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 like they are, like, like they that's really good. are. Yeah. Um, but okay. however, they're very effective, which is what's the main importance of it all. I think yeah. Larry and, and Metro can partner on this and make it happen. <laughs> and possibly there's some of the printers that might want to partner and, and uh, donate. I mean, I can think of a couple that might want to be a part of that and get some recognition for a donation or something. Great. We'll, we'll take any help. Okay. Please send okay. us an email. Okay, any other comments? Um, I guess we will, um, I don't know if this, well, well, we'll ask for a motion to accept the updated report. Motion. Motion to Chase Rotkin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries unanimously. Now to accept Mr. Emerson. Uh, you, this is your last report. This is the last we're going to see of you. Nine right? minutes. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, real quickly the American Public Transit Association's Public Transportation and Universities Biennial Conference. We are the host, and it's becoming real now. Um, the schedule, and I, I would like you to all take note of this, although we will be mailing you. And I think uh, the, there's a little.